We're live. Sergeants, please begin your recordings. Oh, one second here. Hold on. There we go. PC recordings underway. Cloud has started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Katowski. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Farrah Lewis, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us today for this important hearing. Today we have with us Council Members Riley, Cabrera, Cornegy, Adams, Amprey Samuels, Ayala, and if I forgot anyone else, uh, please forgive me. We'll do another round of those. This morning, we are holding a hearing on New York City's mental health emergency response. And we are hearing two pieces of important legislation which I am proud to be co-sponsoring. The first sponsored by Council Member Diana Ayala is intro introduction number 2210 in relation to creating an office of community health and citywide mental health emergency response protocols. We will also hear introduction number 2222 sponsored by public advocate Jamani Williams in relation to creating a three digit mental health emergency hotline. For too many New Yorkers, the impact of untreated mental health, mental illness is, is a mental health crisis, a situation in which a person's mental illness prevents them from being able to care for themselves or function effectively in the community. Mental health crises can disrupt a person's mood and affect their ability to think rationally and cope with their stressors of daily life. Contributing factors to a mental health crisis can range from internal stressors, such as undiagnosed or untreated mental health disorders, to external and environmental stressors, such as changes in home, school, or work life, personal loss, trauma, or exposure to violence. The COVID-19 pandemic has further worsened the mental health and well-being of New Yorkers. According to New York State Health Foundation February 2021 report, one third of all adult New Yorkers reported symptoms of anxiety and or depression at a state at a rate more than triple the previously self-reported pre-pandemic rates. Currently, the New York City Police Department and the Fire Department and emergency medical technicians respond to nearly all mental health 911 calls. Regardless of their severity of health needs, whether a crime is involved or whether there is an imminent risk of violence. It is sad that we need to say this in 2021, but law enforcement professionals are not mental health providers. Even in the best of circumstances, a police response to a mental health emergency is not the appropriate response. The presence of police frequently worsens mental health crises rather than de-escalating or mitigating them, traumatizing the individual suffering, and in worst cases, results of violence and death. Unfortunately, there are too many tragic examples to talk about today. Some of you are aware of those. But I was working as a public servant when Dwayne June from East Flatbush was shot and killed by police. Dwayne was only 32 years old. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was struggling. His mother called 911 and told them that her son was experiencing a mental health emergency. And their response resulted in deadly use of force that killed Dwayne. Dwayne needed mental health intervention, not police. Dwayne needed mental attention. He did not need police. Dwayne needed help, not the police. Dwayne's story is too common and too familiar to New Yorkers, especially black and brown New Yorkers. When mental health emergencies arise, we need mental health responses, not policing. And even before crises ensues, we need, the, we need our most policed and most impacted communities, 
black and brown communities to have more access to affordable, high quality, community-based mental health resources. Too many black and brown New Yorkers live in mental health deserts and they do not have access to health insurance. They don't have culturally sensitive care within their communities and therefore tend to experience higher rates of mental health crises. We need access for all New Yorkers to affordable, culturally sensitive and culturally sensitive mental health care and we need appropriate mental health responses when emergencies arise. So how many more New Yorkers do we need to die or experience violence or trauma at the hands of police before we say enough? Should we try something different? We'll learn today. At today's hearing, the committee will be hearing from administration providers, community-based organizations, and advocates about how New York City can drastically change the way in which we respond to and address mental health crises and emergencies once and for all. I wanna thank administra the administration, DOHMH, Thrive, NYPD, and the FDNY who are here with us today. I know you are committed to working on this issue for all New Yorkers and to effectively address the mental health needs that arise in our communities. And I look forward to hearing from you all today. I also wanna thank my colleagues, as well as committee staff, senior counsel, Sarah Liss, legislative policy analyst, Christy, finance analyst, Lauren, for making this hearing possible today and for all your support over the last couple of weeks. And now I will turn to our bill sponsors, council member Diana Ayala, after her will be council member Cornegy, then public advocate Williams for their opening remarks. Council member Ayala, you may proceed. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the committee. Uh, Chair Lou is really excited to, to be here today. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. Obviously, um, you know, we're co-sponsoring one of the bills um, and this bill is very personal to me and I, I'll share my story. Um, so a few years ago, my family and I were dealing with a situation of a family member in emotional distress. At first, we didn't recognize what was happening, but after a few days, it was pretty apparent that this individual was suffering from a manic episode. I tried for a couple of days to convince this person to seek outpatient care because something just didn't seem uh, right. That person declined um, because they didn't recognize that they were going through something serious. During this time, the person's behavior became more and more erratic until such time as they shared that they had serious concerns about another family member and made comments about seriously hurting that member of the family in an effort to save the entire family. If I told you that I was not afraid to call 911, I would be lying. First, because I felt tremendous guilt. And second, because I was afraid that something would go wrong and that this person may be seriously hurt. I too had heard of all of the cases where 911 was called and a police officer responded and somebody ended up you know, uh, dying as a result. And all of that continued to play over and over in my mind for days and days. I can still remember the feeling of that fear that took over me and I don't wish that on anyone. I eventually made the call and tried to be very clear that no weapon was involved and that the person should be approached calmly. Two NYPD officers responded at first and after having spoken with him for a little while, they all decided collectively to go down and downstairs and to the front of the building and wait for the ambulance. In the hallway, as they were leaving, I was able to, to just stand there and look at both and I'm observing the situation and I could see that there was fear coming from both sides of that hallway. I could, I could tell that the police officers were uneasy with handling the situation and were not sure, you know, as he became more and more erratic, what his, what, what his reaction would be. And I could also tell that he was uneasy about what was about to happen to him. It was almost as if each side was just waiting to see what the other would do. It was a moment in time of feeling, a new awareness that I would never ever forget. Our encounter ended well, but it was apparent to me that police officers, even when armed with the best of intentions, are simply just not equipped to deal with situations like these. De-escalation of a person in mental distress is a skill set that police officers, and quite frankly, many people are just not trained in. So this bill would establish, would require the establishment of an Office of Community Mental Health within the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene. This office would create a citywide mental health emergency response protocol, one which we simply don't have, and a mental health emergency response unit to respond to mental health emergencies within 30 minutes of receiving a mental health emergency call. This bill would also require the office to identify gaps in mental health provisions in New York City. 
coordinate within city agencies and community-based organizations and mental health providers, and provide training to all relevant city agencies regarding the established mental health emergency protocol. This bill would additionally require the New York City Department uh, in conjunction with the Office of Community Mental Health to train all members of service 911 call operators and the academy recruits in the mental health emergency response protocol. Finally, this bill would require the office of, uh, to report monthly and annually about the emergency mental health calls received and other work that the office is conducting. Now, I have heard from the advocates in the last week or so, and I know that there's a lot of excitement, but there's also a lot of you know, concern regarding this bill um, and the continued involvement of the NYPD. And I wanna add that I think that that is the purpose of today's hearing is to really hear what your thoughts are on how we can um, you know, better address the needs of New Yorkers and mental distress in the city. And I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you all for having me. Councilman McCornicky. First of all, thank you and um, congratulations, uh, Madam Chair Lewis. Um, it's another opportunity to watch my colleagues coalesce around a very important issue and to take incredible action, both policy and legislative wise. Um, 1-800-237-8255. Please remember that phone number because it's our National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which can save a life for someone in crisis. If you have a fire in your apartment, call 911. If your garbage wasn't picked up, you can call 311. None of these numbers are appropriate for someone experiencing a mental health or suicide crisis. Many people say they wanna prioritize mental health, especially after the recent stabbings on the A trains. It's time for a phone number for immediate help and assistance that's easy to recall. That's why I'm co-sponsoring the proposal for 2222 um, after the death in my district of Shahid Dassel, who was a young man who was known to the community to have mental health issues. The community helped that young man and when he was in crisis would reach out to the parents and it was just an awful situation because he was killed by officers who had no familiarity uh, and came on the scene. Even the officers who were common to that community were aware of uh, Saheed. It would establish a three-digit hotline staffed by mental health call operators for individuals experiencing a mental health emergency. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the mental health challenges here in New York City. Words cannot express the pain we felt with the wave of death due to coronavirus. Unfortunately, the emotional impacts will continue for years to come, and we need to be better prepared to support ourselves. That's why I'm proud to join council members Ayala and uh, public advocate Jamani Williams in co-sponsoring in intro 2210, which would establish an office of community mental health. We can't wait until the next needless tra tragedy. We need to pass these bills soon as possible and get the health and lifeline to our people struggling with mental health in communities of color and in communities across the city. So thank you so much, uh, Chair Lewis, for hearing this important bills. This is just so, just so you know, this is what we call baptism by fire, uh, not getting an easy situation to have to deal with, but you're more than prepared as a chair uh, to help us and, and foster and usher us through this very difficult time and this very difficult, um, these very difficult. But thank you again. Uh, everybody who's involved in the writing and authoring of these bills. Um, and I look forward to, 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 to the next hearing where we'll be discussing uh, a vote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Cornegy. And now we'll have with us Public Advocate Williams that I know has been working very hard on this piece of legislation. Public Advocate Williams. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. As I mentioned, my name is Jemani Williams, Public Advocate for the City of New York. I wanna thank Chair Farrell Lewis for holding today's hearing. This vital topic and give a huge congratulations uh, for the first uh, uh, hearing that you're chairing. Looking forward to the excellent leadership I know you're going to provide on this issue and many others uh, in this hearing, uh, in this uh, committee. Uh, a few years ago, when I was council member, uh, I'll never forget, I was doing, I believe it was a gun violence press conference with uh, Borough President Eric Adams. In the middle of it, a woman ran up, got on her knees, and was begging us for help for her son who was in mental health crisis. Uh, it was a very emotional time. But I remember her very specifically saying how terrified she was to call 911. She didn't want to call 911 because they would kill him. That was the word that she used. Uh, and that has been said in my brain, uh, remembering that. And at that point, understanding uh, the, the intersecting issues that were being brought up there, the need for her uh, to get some real care for her son 
Uh, and also the, uh, the things that we were doing to police officers, the, the, the places we were sending them without the tools or the training uh, and asking them to solve a problem that they simply don't have the capability to solve. On all sides, we're setting up people for failure. For far too long, our city's response to mental health calls has been a failure. Police officers are dispatched as first responders for people struggling with mental illness. In addition, access to a continuum of care is in effect non-existent for a large part of the population. In some cases, this can be fatal. In the past six years, at least 16 people undergoing a mental health crisis were killed by officers. Notably, 14 were people of more color. That is both devastating and a significant reason as to why the New York City Police Department cannot respond to mental health calls as the first responders. That's the, my first report in September of 2019. Uh, we put out uh, a report on how badly we were doing and handling mental health crises. Uh, and I wanna just congratulate the city council for putting uh, this hearing and actually going headstrong uh, into dealing with this and beginning to reframe what public safety is. After many years of waiting, we have the opportunity to change our response. Intro 2210, prime sponsor by Councilman Bayala, shifts mental health responses from the NYPD into a new office within the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Units of mental health clinicians and peers will respond to mental health emergencies within 30 minutes of a call. These teams will follow up with calls among other things that are mentioned there. In addition to that, my legislation intro 2222 creates a three digit hotline as an alternative to 911. Right now, we only have a criminal response to what everyone has known to be a health crisis. The newly created office would hire operators to respond to calls. Any mental health related calls going through 311 or 911 would be redirected through this new three digit hotline. Calls will not be directed to 911 unless an operator determines there is a public safety emergency. Finally, the hotline becomes available no later than December 31st of this year. Currently, the NYC well system is used for mental health calls. In 2019, there were around 170,000 mental health related calls. Yet those calls went through 911. There must be a convenient and easy to remember number rather than the city's long 11 digit NYC well system. That's why the bill will create a three digit number, 988, that will redefine our response system. These bills offer a chance for us to rectify the failures of our mental health responses. Cities such as Eugene, Oregon, Olympia, Washington, and others have already implemented non-police or limited police responses. We must follow these examples and go bold with any idea presented. New Yorkers deserve a plan that addresses mental health as a public health issue, not a policing one. However, we know we have to be more intentional. These bills must do more to explain the role of when and if police department would get involved. The definition of public safety emergency, a crime in progress, violence, or a situation likely to result in imminent harm or danger to the public as defined by the newly off created Office of Community Mental Health in its vagueness may cause unintended confusion. How will a person interpret violence or a situation that may result in harm? Interpretation is left up to the officer or realistically, the operator. What happens if police are mistakenly told a person likely to create harm? This is not hypothetical. As was mentioned here, police responded to a call that Sahid Vassal, as a 34-year-old black man living with bipolar disorder, held a gun. Police arrived and fairly shot Vassal, who actually held a pipe, not a gun. Also mentioned was the tragic case of Duane June that happened in uh, the district I represented several years ago. Those tragic events and many others highlights the potential danger that can result from one wrong decision or a misinterpretation. If this is not delved into more intentionally, I fear more lives may be lost. We have seen far too many instances where the inclusion of officers in unpredicted situations wrongfully escalate. Mental health should not be seen or responded to as an untreated public threat. I understand that many of the advocates and providers we'll hear from today are also concerned with the codification of core response teams and, many other, and some other features in both of these bills. What we should make sure to ensure is a codification that police are no longer the first responders when New Yorkers are in acute mental health crisis. I believe Councilmember Ayala, Councilmember Carnegie, and the chair, as well as myself, are deeply committed to getting this right. And I'm sure we welcome any feedback on how we can best improve the bills. Today's hearing is yet another step in the right direction as we're identifying the city's existing problem, an ineffective mental health response. 
we know there are other professionals and peers in our communities that are better equipped to address mental health crises than the police. I hope through our legislative process, we can collectively create a crisis response where persons living with mental health diagnosis feel safe in their communities and know they'll receive the proper care that they need. I also hope that we can bring healing to families that have experienced a loss or any trauma as a result of the system we now have in place. I know this is a difficult conversation. It is one that elicits fear. It is one that changes the dynamic. For too long, our equation of public safety to police uh, have brought us a system that we know needs to be changed. In doing that, we'll be concerned. Uh, I know folks will bring up the fact, uh, we have to also remember uh, that when something goes wrong, if something went wrong, everyone will say, well, where was the police? We have to change that dynamic because we know even when police are, are there, things go wrong and people are killed. And so that can't be directly where we go. We have to find a system that allows people to bring the tools and expertise that they have uh, to the situations at hand. And right now, we're not doing that. I thank the chair for allowing me to speak. And I look forward to today's testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you, Public Advocate Williams. And now we'll turn to committee counsel, Sarah List, to go over some procedural matters for the hearing. But before we do that, just want to mention that Council Member Van Bramer, Rosenthal, and Borelli has joined us. Now Thank we'll turn to the Thank you very much, Chair Lewis. I am Sara Liss, Legislative Counsel in the New York City Council, and I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanted to go over a couple of procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify, and you will then be unmuted by the host. As always, we wanna note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. I will now call on members of the administration to testify, and that will include members who are testifying and members of the administration with questions, who will be answering questions. Susan Herman, Director, Office of Thrive NYC, Dr. Myla Harrison, Acting Executive Deputy Commissioner, Division of Mental Hygiene at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Rebecca Lynn Walton, PhD, LCSW, Assistant Vice President, Office of Behavioral Health at New York City Health and Hospitals. Dr. David Prezan, Chief Medical Officer, FDNY. Teresa Tobin, PhD, Chief of Interagency Operations, NYPD and Michael Clark, Managing Attorney of Legislative Affairs for NYPD. I will first administer the oath and after I will call on each panelist of the administration to test to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Herman. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner, Dr. Harrison. I, I didn't hear you, Dr. Harrison, sorry. I do. Thank you. Vice President, Dr. Lynn Walton. I do. Chief Dr. Prezant. I do. Chief Dr. Tobin. I do. And Managing Attorney Clark. I do. Thank you very much. Director Herman, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Lewis and members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addictions. My name is Susan Herman, and I'm a Senior Director to the Mayor and Director of the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC. I am joined by several colleagues, Dr. Myla Harrison, Acting Executive Commissioner of the Division of Mental Hygiene at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Chief Teresa Tobin, Chief of Intergovernmental Operations at the NYPD, Dr. David Prezant, Chief Medical Officer for the FDNY, and Dr. Rebecca Lynn Walton, Assistant Vice President, Behavioral Health of NYC Health and Hospitals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Sorry, I just had to get something off the screen. First, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Chair Lewis. We enjoyed a close and productive partnership with former Chair Ayala, and we are very much looking forward to working with you as you take over chairing this important committee. 
The Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, created in 2019, is the first mayoral office devoted to promoting access to mental health care for New Yorkers. We currently oversee 30 programs designed to close critical gaps in mental health care through innovation. Our programmatic budget, as well as data on the reach and impact of our work, are all on our website. In addition, we promote cross-agency collaboration and help shape mental health policy in the city. This work includes chairing the Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force of over 80 experts from the nonprofit sector, elected leaders, and city government. We also chair the Mental Health Council, which includes the leadership of over 30 city agencies working together to maximize the city's mental health-related initiatives. Over the last seven years, the city has made great progress strengthening how we prevent and respond to mental health crises. We appreciate that the city council has been a critical partner in this effort. The legislation we're discussing today should be viewed in the context of what we have seen work and the progress already underway. I'd like to begin by discussing crisis prevention. As many of you have already noted, many mental health crises can be prevented if people are able to access and stay connected to needed care. Yet for decades, too many New Yorkers have gone without mental health treatment or support when and where they have needed it. There are 17 federally designated mental health care shortage areas in New York City. Like food deserts, these are neighborhoods without sufficient access to mental health care. One way we have worked to increase access to care is by changing the mental health care landscape. Thrive programs have added hundreds of new service locations across the city, over 70 of which are in the federally designated mental health care shortage areas. We have partnered with 13 city agencies and nearly 200 community-based organizations to add new on-site support in over 200 high-need schools, 100 shelters for families, 45, shelter, 45 centers rather for older adults, every precinct and PSA in the city and all runaway and homeless youth residents. That's on-site care in all those locations. We also support 57 mobile treatment teams that bring intensive ongoing clinical care to people with serious mental health challenges right in their communities. We have also expanded access to services through NYC Well the city's comprehensive mental health helpline that serves as a gateway to care thousands of times every week. Starting out as a suicide hotline, NYC Well now answers calls, texts, texts, and chats for a wide range of behavioral health needs. It offers immediate support, referrals for ongoing treatment, and when appropriate, deploys mobile crisis teams to respond to urgent concerns in person. In 2020, New York City Well answered an average of 6,200 requests for support every week. These new services build on a strong foundation. Apart from its partnership with Thrive NYC, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene spends nearly $500 million annually for people with mental health concerns, substance misuse, and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Among other services, this includes supportive housing, crisis respite centers, mobile treatment, and school-based mental health services. New York City Health and Hospitals, again, apart from its partnership with Thrive NYC, invests about $800 million every year in acute inpatient and outpatient behavioral health services. The Department of Homeless Services, street outreach teams, and safe havens increasingly connect people to behavioral health care. And NYC Care, our citywide guarantee of health care, includes behavioral health services. The city has made significant progress over the last seven years. A lot of new work began in 2014 with the Task Force on Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice System, which brought together over 300 advocates, practitioners, academics, and government officials to develop recommendations to reduce the number of people with behavioral health needs who cycle through the criminal justice system. All of these recommendations are now underway, including new support for people awaiting trial or detained in the city's jails, crisis intervention training for police officers, and support and connection centers, formerly known as diversion centers, 
which offer short-term stabilization services to people with mental health and substance use needs. The East Harlem Support and Connection Center, which opened a year ago, gives police officers an alternative to avoidable emergency room visits or enforcement interventions. The city's collaborative work on mental health crises continued through the recommendations of the Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force, approved by the mayor in 2019. Even with the COVID-19 pandemic and a fiscal crisis, we have brought many of these recommendations to life. While we could not add more ACT mobile treatment teams as we had planned because of the state's cap on Medicaid, we have added four new intensive mobile treatment teams fully funded by the city, bringing the total capacity of all the mobile treatment teams functioning in the city to almost 4,000 clients at any given time. These teams continue to make a profound difference in people's lives. For example, during the first three months of the fiscal year, we could see that of those clients who began receiving IMT services while homeless, many of whom were experiencing street homelessness, 47% moved into permanent housing during their engagement with IMT, and 90% of clients stayed connected to treatment for 12 or more months. Mobile treatment teams serve people who otherwise might never have been connected to either housing or treatment, and they are no doubt helping to prevent crises. The result? Right now, with all of these new services in place, New York City provides more mental health support to more people in more places and in more ways than ever before. Now I'd like to discuss crisis response. Not all crises require an emergency response. Some mental health crises require an urgent but not an immediate response. For that reason, we have also enhanced our mental health urgent response infrastructure. Mobile crisis teams include clinicians and peers who provide in-person assessments and connection to care for people experiencing behavioral health crises. These teams are deployed about 20,000 times a year by NYC Well, public hospitals, and healthcare providers. Because of the Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force, they will soon be able to respond to people within a few hours during the day and early evening every day of the year. This reflects great improvement from only a year ago when most responses were the next day and weekend calls resulted in significant delays. As more New Yorkers become aware of this service and experience it, we hope to see more and more people turning to NYC Well and mobile crisis teams rather than 911. As we enter 2021, following several years in which more mental health services have been available to New Yorkers, and we are both preventing and responding to crises more effectively, we are beginning to see the tide turn. Mental health emergencies are declining. From 2008 to 2018, the number of mental health 911 calls in New York City nearly doubled, increasing every year and in every precinct. In 2019, the total number of calls dropped for the first time in a decade. Mental health calls dropped for the first time in a decade by 5% or over 8,000 calls. In 2020, the number of calls fell by another 6% or over 9,000 calls. And according to a recent NYC Well evaluation by an independent evaluator, more than 20% of surveyed NYC Well users who contacted NYC Well for themselves, reported that they would have considered calling 911 or going to an emergency room if not for NYC Well. They knew they had another option. To continue this positive momentum, in November, the mayor announced that for the first time in our history, health professionals will be the default response to 911 mental health crisis calls. This new health-centered approach called Be Heard, the Behavioral Health Emergency Assistance Response Division, will be a critical step toward forward in the city's commitment to treat mental health crises as public health problems, not public safety issues. Currently, NYPD officers and FDNY EMS emergency medical technicians respond to all mental health crisis calls to 911. 
This is regardless of the severity of the mental health need or whether a crime is involved or whether there is an imminent risk of violence. All 911 mental health calls get this joint response. Beginning in spring 2021 in Northern Manhattan, specifically the 2528 and 32 precincts in East and Central Harlem, the new mental health response teams of health and hospital social workers and FDNY EMTs will be the new primary response to mental health emergencies. In emergency situations involving a weapon or imminent risk of harm, NYPD officers and EMTs will continue to respond as before. Mental health response teams will have the experience and expertise to de-escalate crisis situations and respond to a range of behavioral health problems, such as suicidal ideation, substance misuse, and serious mental illness, as well as physical health problems, which can be exacerbated by or mask mental health problems. This pilot has been shaped by a steering committee that includes FDNY, NYC Health and Hospitals, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, NYPD, and the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC. We have been intentional about its design. We have consulted cities across the country that are undertaking similar work and have met with members of the Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force, advocates from Correct Crisis Intervention Today, CCIT NYC, and elected officials to hear their thoughts. First, we think it makes good sense to build on the tremendous capacity and decades of experience within FDNY's emergency medical services, which currently responds to over 150,000 mental health emergencies every year. EMTs will be able to arrive on the scene within minutes and have expertise to assess and treat many, many health issues. Second, health and hospitals, the largest public hospital system in the country, is the city's behavioral health safety net operating psychiatric emergency departments, as well as inpatient and outpatient behavioral health care. h, &H also manages several mobile crisis teams and assertive community treatment teams or ACT teams that offer ongoing mobile treatment to people with serious mental illness in their communities. EMS and h, &H both have deep expertise running emergency operations. These are the right partners to create the right teams of experienced EMTs and social workers, and they are the right partners to provide the appropriate training and supervision for these teams. Third, in introducing this entirely new service to New York City, we have ensured that we are integrating lessons learned in other jurisdictions. Our model builds on the most established program in the country, CAHOOTS crisis assistance helping out on the streets in Eugene, Oregon. CAHOOTS, a program of a community-based clinic, handles cases sent by their 911 system, first screened by their 911 system, designed to address a wide array of physical and mental health problems in nonviolent situations, CAHOOTS teams of paramedics and social workers responded to approximately 24,000 calls last year. New York City will be the largest city to roll out this kind of an approach. To inform our pilot, we have also spoken to large cities such as Denver, Chicago, and San Francisco that are just beginning this work, as well as nearby Ulster, Albany, and Orange counties. All of these programs are dispatched out of 911. There are many similarities with our model. Every model is using a social worker or a clinician and an emergency medical responder an EMT or a paramedic. No team exceeds three people. No team is directly providing medical transports to hospitals. Each is calling ambulances to provide transport when needed. Denver and San Francisco are basing their teams within their EMS services function of their fire departments, as are we, and contracting out for social workers to add to their teams. Chicago is pursuing a hybrid model they plan to hire some mental health professionals directly through their health department and contract with community partners to hire others. They wanna test both approaches. None of these teams will respond to 911 calls that involve violence. While there's some variation in how cities define violence, 
the presence of a weapon automatically excludes these new teams from responding in every city we have spoken to, including the CAHOOTS model in Oregon. The design of New York City's pilot differs from models elsewhere in several key ways. Some cities are integrating pre-existing mobile crisis teams into their 911 system. In New York City, mobile crisis teams respond to urgent situations, not emergencies. In some cities, peers are part of the crisis response team, in addition to mental health clinicians. Denver and San Francisco's models are overseen by their local public health authorities. However, in both of these cities, their health authority includes the entire public hospital system. In New York City, our public hospital system is a separate entity, health and hospitals. There are also some limitations on the kinds of situations teams respond to. For instance, in San Francisco, teams are only dispatched to public locations. In big cities nationwide, health-centered approaches to mental health emergencies are new. Denver's began in June 2020, San Francisco's in November 2020, and Chicago is aiming to begin in the summer of 2021. There are few established best practices yet in large cities. We are all designing these initial pilots carefully and learning from one another. Fourth, we wanted to ensure that the teams in the pilot phase of are based in communities with sufficient operational infrastructure to support rapid implementation and a range of community mental health care options. We needed to select a single 911 radio dispatch zone, usually two or three contiguous precincts where everyone is on the same radio frequency, making dispatch easier. We chose zone seven, which includes the 25, 28 and 32 precincts or East Harlem and parts of North and Central Harlem because of the high volume of mental health calls. Zone seven had 9,058 mental health 911 calls in 2019 and 7,400 or more calls between January and November in 2012, 2020, sorry, the most in the city. And the complete numbers as of the end of 2020, I understand, take us slightly higher, but they were the most, they were the highest in 2020. H&H &H has hospitals, clinics, and a psychiatric emergency program in this zone, and the new East Harlem Support and Connection Center which offers short-term stabilization services is here as well. Furthermore, EMS has facilities nearby that could be quickly adapted to serve as a base for operations. We've been hard at work over the last few months. Operational protocols are nearly finalized. The training is designed and hiring is underway. We will launch as soon as everyone is hired and trained. Once we launch, we will monitor this project to ensure we can scale, go citywide as quickly as possible. Specifically, we will gather detailed data on metrics such as the percentage of mental health 911 calls selected for the new teams, the number of teams times the new teams are dispatched, the time from dispatch to arrival on scene, and the kinds of locations to which the teams are dispatched and how calls are resolved. This pilot represents an important change in how New York City responds to mental health crises. And it is imperative that we get it right. We wanna make sure the protocols are correct, the training is sufficient, and the staffing levels are right before we expand. But the plan is to go citywide as soon as we can. Given the work currently underway, the city shares a commitment to the spirit of intro number 2210, which would create an Office of Community Mental Health and a citywide mental health emergency response protocol. However, we think it's premature to mandate citywide implementation of a different model with different agencies involved. There is too much to learn from the pilot to decide now to use a different approach. The city also has concerns with intro 2222, which would create a three digit, digit mental health emergency hotline. As I mentioned earlier, a recent independent evaluation of NYC Well made clear that many New Yorkers are already turning to this helpline instead of calling 911 or going to an emergency room. Staffed by trained counselors and peers, 
NYC Well can provide immediate crisis counseling and suicide prevention, as well as dispatch mobile crisis teams to provide in-person assessments for people experiencing a behavioral health crisis. The city has invested in capacity at NYC Well, refined its services, and conducted significant outreach to New Yorkers to encourage them to contact this helpline. In addition, last summer, the FCC enacted rules to establish 988 as the three-digit phone number to connect people in crisis with suicide prevention and mental health crisis counselors. By July 2022, all phone service providers will connect 988 calls to the existing National Suicide Prevention Hotline. In New York City, NYC Well answers the National Suicide Prevention Hotline calls. As such, we believe existing infrastructure already accomplishes many of the aims contemplated in this bill. We have not found an alternative three-digit number in any jurisdiction in the country that dispatches emergency responses. We teach our children from a very young age to call 911 in any kind of emergency, whether it's a safety problem, a fire, or a health emergency. You shouldn't have to think hard about who to call in an emergency. If it's any kind of emergency, call 911. I thank this committee for your ongoing partnership and commitment to continuing to strengthen mental health crisis prevention and response in our city. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And we now turn to Chair Lewis to begin questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. We've also been joined by Council Member Lander. All right, so I'll just jump right in. Um, the first question is, do you believe, and anyone on the panel can answer this, do you believe that NYPD, police, law enforcement, whatever we want to call it, um, is the right response for a mental health call? We believe that the primary response to a mental health crisis should be a health-centered response. And that's why we're joining together the experience of EMTs and social workers to respond to primarily what are mental health crises. So does the city consider, what, what does the city consider a mental health response? A mental health response? Yes. It's, well, it depends on whether we're talking about, I, I tried to distinguish in my testimony, the difference between mental health responses that are connecting people to care and, and in that way trying to avert crises to mental health crises where people need an urgent response, but not necessarily an immediate one within minutes and an emergency where someone needs to have attention within minutes. All of these, we believe the, the primary response whenever possible should be a health-centered response. Right, so what, what is the current protocol when responding to 911 calls um, that may be triggered by mental health emergencies? Because I think that's the part of the reason why they're presenting this bill today. So what is the current protocol for responding to the 911 calls? The current protocol for 911 mental health crises is a combination of a police response and an EMS response. And that's why we're shifting to a new format and piloting EMTs and social workers. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the data because I think that's that'll help with some of the issues that you know we've been bringing up with these bills and conversations over time. So can you please describe what kind of data the the city currently collects on incidents of mental health crisis response? Like well, how many calls, how many calls does the city receive per year on mental health responses and what platforms does the city, does the calls, um, what platforms does the calls go through? Is that 311, 911, NYC? Well, I know there's different components. Well, certainly I'll begin and just say that calls that come through 911 that people calling are calling because it's an emergency response. There were in 2020, 
there were 154,000 mental health crisis calls as opposed to 2018 when there were 171,000 crisis calls. And that's the decline that I was talking about. I will turn to Dr. Harrison to talk about the numbers of people who call NYC well. I, I have said that there are over 6,000 um, contacts with for calls, texts, and chats to, nine, to NYC well every week. Myla, do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, so, you know, the NYC well um, call center, it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is staffed with counselors uh, and peers and is available to uh, receive any kinds of calls that come their way. And as, um, you know, as Susan said, at this point, we are um, answering by call, text, or chat well over 1,000 calls a day. And that volume is higher than we have seen in the past. Most of the calls for NYC Well are, um, are resolved with people on the line. They will evaluate, assess for crisis, for um, de-escalation, and will make referrals um, to appropriate services uh, where that's um, being requested. And um, a very small portion of the calls to NYC Well will go to a mobile crisis team, a very small percentage. Most of the calls that come in are people asking for information or referral. When it is a higher level of uh, need, then they can involve a mobile crisis team. Again, from the NYC Well perspective, in a general year, only about 10,000 of those calls that come through are going to mobile crisis teams. So most are managed by the, the counselors uh, responding on the phone. Dr. Harrison, is the data disaggregated by zip code, race, ethnicity, gender? So you're, mm -hmm. so you're asking about the NYC Well calls that we get. So NYC Well, for the most part, um, will not require you to give information if you do not want to give information about um, your race, ethnicity, uh, gender. So it is an anonymous line. When um, somebody gets to the point of needing a referral for a mobile crisis team, then obviously they need information about uh, where that person's located, address, phone number, that sort of information. So we do not have complete data on the, the people who are calling because people don't have to reveal that information. So we have incomplete data about um, who is accessing the line for the most part. We do ask it when people will reveal it, but again, it is not complete. And then, um, as I said, for mobile crisis team referrals, we know where they are going because they have to actually go on site. So we have that level of information from NYC Well. A, um, an independent evaluation of NYC Well, which does disaggregate uh, the demographics of a large sampling of NYC Well users. And that full evaluation is on our website. And we'd be happy to get that to you. But I think, I think it's important to note that there, we're talking about many different things. We're talking about preventing through connecting people to care, keeping people connected to care, we're talking about urgent responses and we're talking about emergency responses where you need people there within minutes. So I just wanna keep distinguishing those things. Thank you. So in regards to the mobile crisis team, who's collecting this data? Is it Thrive, NYPD, Do It, DOH? The, the mobile crisis teams are dispatched both by NYC Well and by hospitals. They're overseen by the health department and as well as the state. They're licensed by the state. Got it. Uh, let's talk really quickly about gaps in, in mental health care and treatment, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues who have questions. Does the city analyze gaps in mental health treatment across all five boroughs? Yes. The, the health department regularly distributes a community health survey to determine access to care. Um, we have focus groups. We look at 
um, emergency room data, we look at 911 information, we look at the federally designated mental health care shortage areas. There are a number of ways that we look at how, how many of New Yorkers who need care are connected to care. Um, surveys, lots of different ways, different agencies are looking at it. And do we track this information? Like, can that information that you're sharing now be shared with the council? There's, there are also, there's a report that the health department creates for the state every year that is a public report that can be shared. But um, Myla, do you share the uh, results of the community health survey? I think you're trying to say yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, sorry, I missed my, I missed my unmute can, sorry about that. Um, so the community health survey um, is uh, administered by the health department on a regular basis. And the, the data um, is available publicly. We frequently also will put out reports um, for the, the data from the community health survey. Um, and that is a broad health survey, it includes uh, mental health and substance use, as well as a lot of other health information. Um, a few years ago, there were um, there were community um, surveys that were released that compiled a few years of data so that they were able to talk at community levels, and those are available um, on the, the City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's website as well. Um, the, the, uh, it, what you should know about community health surveys, it, it takes time to analyze the data. And so it's not always a timely way to get at what's happening today, but it is certainly useful information um, that we compare over time. So we can see changes over time um, at, at various levels. All right, thank you for that, Dr. Harrison. I'll come back with more questions. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues that have a few questions. Thank you very much, Chair. And as a reminder to council members, if you have a question, you can use the Zoom raise hand function at the bottom of the screen. So for questions, we're gonna turn first to council member Ayala, followed by council member Amphrey Samuel, followed by council member Adams, uh, followed by council member Riley. So council member Ayala, you can begin when you're ready. Hi, um, good morning, everyone. So I, I have a couple of questions. Um, First, will the EMS mental health teams fall under Thrive Managed Program um, Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force? They'll be, they, they, have they have grown out of the work of that task force and they'll be overseen by Thrive, but they are, they are managed by, implemented by FDNY EMS and h, &H. Um, NYPD is um, certainly working with us and the Department of Health is working with us to make sure that all aspects of it are appropriate. But they will be, these teams will be managed by h, &H and FDNY EMS, overseen by Thrive. Um, Director Herman, you mentioned in your, in, in your opening remarks that, um, that it's premature to, to it's premature to introduce this bill 2210, right, at a time when we're piloting this new uh, program, which, you know, I'm excited about, obviously, it's in my district, and I'm excited to see it uh, coming to my district. But I wonder, we have nine months left in this administration. Is it realistic to believe that we have enough time to one pilot and then um, expand this existing program, if successful, citywide in that time frame? I think we have 10 months left, don't we? Yeah. yeah. So we'll be up and on the ground shortly and we will be gathering data and we will be seeking your input, community members from the districts involved, making sure that we modify it as needed, but we are planning for an expansion and we will, we will do everything we can to start phasing that in if necessary or go citywide if possible. How long is how long how long is the pilot period? Do you, is there an estimated time? Well, we will we will know very shortly within a month, forty five days, you know, two months. We will know whether the the protocols are right and the training is sufficient, and we can start to think about expanding. Yeah, I I think that's, well, that's we will be modifying it and adapting it 
for a long time, but I think we will know very soon whether this model is a good model. I hope we always improve it like everything else. Okay. Um, so re regarding the gaps in, in services, because I think, you know, this, this bill kind of tackles two things. One, it creates an office of mental health responses with protocols and, and all of the good stuff, but it also asks for, you know, a, 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 a protocol that also addresses and identifies gaps in services. So the family member that I referenced, right, um, as an example, um, you know, even as a young child, right, I remember uh, my parents trying to access, you know, uh, certain mental health services for them and not being able to do that. I remember, you know, um, the sense of really just like, you know, being overwhelmed and not knowing who to turn to next and trying to get PINS petitions. And then eventually this, you know, individual ending up, you know, as a child, you know, incarcerated and then incarcerated again and again and not being, uh, you know, I mean, I can, I can name, you know, 20, 30 instances where, you know, something should have happened that did not happen. Um, you know, some as recent as last week. Um, is, is, this, is this something that the Department of Health is looking at? For instance, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw out their health and hospitals, right? You, you bring a person in for an emergency health crisis. That person is seen by, you know, uh, the on-site uh, physician, right? And they decide, well, you know what? There's nothing wrong. Maybe the person was manic when you, know, when you made the call, but they seem fine now and they put them out on the street. That's a problem. Sometimes they're admitted for 72 hour hold. And I have spoken to psychiatrists after psychiatrists who have told me that they have had instances where uh, patients have gone to the mental health courts that exist within some of these hospitals and that the judges have actually released against doctor's orders. That to me is also a missed opportunity. So I wonder is like, is, is, the, is health and hospitals working with the Department of Health or with Thrive to identify some of the gaps um, so that you can better advocate to address them? Well, there, there are many ways that we have worked with the Department of Homeless Services, Department of Corrections, H&H, &H, the Department of Health, NYPD, to make sure that people with needs are connected to the care that they should have. So there have been many protocol changes. Agencies are talking to each other and sharing information more than ever before. We have made it easier for mobile treatment teams to go to Rikers and meet people before they are discharged. We've made it easier for the Department of Homeless Services to say, these are the, these are the people that we are most concerned about and give their names to the health department and focus attention on them. We've added mobile treatment teams. We're about 50% greater capacity now than we were five or six years ago in terms of serving people on mobile treatment teams. So we're trying to do that. If you're asking specifically about H and H and their protocols when somebody comes in, I'd ask Rebecca to, to I mean, talk about it a little bit. Yeah, that, but it's not specific to just health and hospitals. I think that sometimes, you know, I mean there are and I'm not I'm not I'm not implying that we don't have resources in place and that, you know, some people may not be benefiting from them. But not all of the people that should be receiving these services or should be coming in contact with someone is at this moment, right? And that that concerns me because I think that, you know, in some communities like my community, we're seeing the highest rates of, you know, of calls, but then, you know, you walk out into the street, it's pretty obvious that we have a lot of people that are just walking around in serious mental crisis. Um, and that's that to me is really alarming. And I and I get, you know, I mean, I, I just, I don't see, I don't see that, I, you know, I'm trying to figure out who is responsible for ensuring the quality control, right? Is this working? Is it not working? How do we tweak it? Are we using family members? Are we using people that are impacted, right? As informants, are they contributing to the conversation? Are they sharing with you and is somebody listening? Because I think it's very easy for all of us, right? To check off a box and say, well, we did this and we're doing that, but is it working? Because a lot of money, quite frankly, into a lot of these programs and services, and they don't always work, right? They need to be tweaked along the lines. Um, and I just wonder who's responsible for that? Who's who's picking up where those gaps in services are because they exist and they impact communities of color the most. So who's responsible for that? Well, let's let's break it down and talk about 
It's not, it's, it is, while I am very pleased with the progress that the city has made, and we've made enormous progress over the last seven years, I'll be, and I think every person on this panel would be right there with you saying more needs to be done. And that there are still inequities in mental health care that we need to reach black and brown people in more ways than we are. We need more treatment to be available and we need it to be easy to access. So I, I absolutely agree that more can be done. How are we working on this though? I, I would like you to hear a little bit from uh, Myla about heat teams and I'd like you to hear a little bit from Rebecca about what happens when somebody goes to a hospital and the kind of work that's done. Rebecca, why don't you start? Thanks so much. Um, and I just wanted to thank you all for having me here today. I too believe in this work on a personal level. I've helped family and friends navigate through serious uh, behavioral health needs and also been the recipient of life-saving services myself. So I try to come to work every single day with a spirit of service, identifying gaps for New York's most vulnerable and trying to get them the same care that did save my life. So I hear you and the pandemic has made this work even more dire. You know, I would say what's most beneficial official about a pilot is the opportunity to, we're building a really intensive supervision model. And that's what I got in the beginning of my days as a social worker. And what really led to me knowing what to do in a crisis, how to talk to someone, how to not get in the way of providing help if I get scared or anything like that. And so what's so important about a pilot is the ability each week to have that intensive supervision, to have a small group where we're meeting with the EMT workers and also the social workers. And we have a supervision structure where we're really able to say in an honest way, here's what's working, here's what's not working. And then the directors of the program are involved at a high level and also on the ground as well, so they can see how it's working as well. Uh, with regards to what happens when someone comes to the hospital, the first answer is I don't want people to go, we don't want people to go to the hospital who don't need it. So a major purpose of this work is so that people don't need to go to the hospital, which can destabilize them further or may not be necessary. So we wanna provide care right there in the community. And I'll let Dr. Harrison talk about that in one second. But then if people are brought to the hospital, we're working constantly to figure out how to make it so that once they leave the hospital, they're still connected, they're still involved. We have people go out to them we're working to identify additional needs and additional types of staff with peers. We have peers right there in the emergency department in inpatient psychiatry, and then also uh, peers with substance use uh, experience as well, either their own or family members who can help. Sometimes those are underlying issues that lead to needs for emergency care that if they had been seen earlier and gotten care earlier, they wouldn't have reached that emergency moment. So I think we're constantly trying to figure out the same thing you are with what's not working and how to provide better care to keep people engaged in treatment and not have an emergency. Thank you, Myla. Yeah, thank you again for that, that you know, these, these really thoughtful questions. The health department's committed to ensure that every New Yorker who experiences a mental health crisis or emergency has access to timely mental health care. And, there are numbers, uh, you know, a number of uh, services that we offer to help with those connections. And you've heard uh, talk about some of them already, some of our um, mobile treatment teams, which include assertive community treatment teams and intensive mobile treatment teams where they focus a lot on engagement. And then there are also HEAT teams, our health engagement and assessment teams, which are made up of peers, people with lived experience, and clinicians who really will work with individuals and engage with them and make the connection to the services that they need. They will stay involved for a few months as long as it takes to help make the connections to the next level of care, um, which is what I, I kind of heard you talking about um, in terms of your question. So I think there are, there are numbers of ways of, that we do that. Um, and I just gave you a few examples. Yeah. I mean, I think the experiences is, is, it varies from person to person, but, you mm -hmm. know, as a, as a family member who deals with this every single day, um, it's been really interesting because I, I, you know, I'm, I'm keenly aware of all of the ways in which we continue to fail people with mental health issues. 
Um, and it's continuing to happen today, right? And I and I get like, listen, I want to applaud all of the efforts because I know how hard you all work on these issues every single day. And I don't want to take any of that credit away. And I am not trying to diminish or, you know, undermine any of the work that you have been doing. I think that this bill offers us a very unique opportunity to really codify a lot of those good policy, you know, ideas um, and ensure that they outlive this administration, right? That where we're doing good work, that we're able to keep that and that we're able to, uh, to just, you know, protect it in that way. Um, I'm happy to, you know, to continue the conversation. I wanna obviously allow time, um, you know, my, I'm sure that my colleagues have a million questions as well, but thank you uh, and thank you, uh, Chair Lewis. Thank you very much, Council Member Ayala. Uh, we now turn to Council Member Amprey Samuel, followed by Council Member Adams, followed by Council Member Riley. Council Member Amprey Samuel, you can begin as soon as the host unmutes you. Thank you very much. Starting time. Uh, of course, um, Council Member Ayala asked exactly what I was um, going to ask and say, um, but that's usually how our districts work. We usually have the same exact issues um, always. And so um, thank you so much for that, um, Council Member Ayala. Um, but I do wanna just add that I had four young black men killed by police in my district since I started my term and they all had a mental illness and they were all known to have a mental illness. And again, I had four young black men with a history of mental illness killed in my district in the past three and a half years of being in office. And that hurts like hell. It hurts like hell. And I personally had to experience um, my own mother. It looks like uh, Council Member Amprey Samuel might be having some technical issues. Uh, so we can turn to Council Member Adams and then come back to Council Member Amprey Samuel. Starting time. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations, Chair Lewis. You look very, very good up there doing this thing. So congratulations to you on this wonderful committee. Uh, thank you um, to my uh, wonderful colleague uh, that preceded you as well. Uh, Council Member Ayala uh, for bringing her personal situation to this committee, uh, which we all have felt since day one of her taking the seat. She has absolutely flourished and brought this to the attention of so many that she doesn't even realize how many uh, she's brought this very critical situation uh, to the forefront. So for that, I salute you as well. Councilmember Ayala and everything that you've done and continue to do. Uh, my, my first question, um, I, I think when it's directed to the NYPD and just taking a look at the percentage of mental health emergency calls uh, per year compared to other calls. Do you have that figure? I'm trying to see the NYPD on the screen. NYPD is muted. Someone can unmute them? Okay. Yeah. So in terms of 911 calls, we, yeah. in 2020, we had about 160,000 uh, person in crisis calls um, and about 6.2 million uh, 911 calls overall. Um, I haven't done the math on that, but it's that's the numbers. Like the, the percentage, I haven't done the percentage math on it, but that's those are the numbers. Okay, so the 160,000 have to do specifically with mental health calls? Right, and out of 6.2 million calls for service. Okay, and do you have any statistics on how many of those uh, mental health responses resulted to transference to a hospital 
uh, or were possibly arrested? 36% were taken to the hospital and less than 1% were arrested. What was that figure for arrest? Less than 1%. Okay. Okay. Um, I had another question for you about percentages of homeless, uh, homeless, re homeless response compared to resident individuals when it comes to mental health. Uh, I don't have that breakdown. Okay. We can look into that, but uh, yeah, I don't have how much of that is uh, homeless individuals versus uh, people with homes. Council Member Adams, are you asking for the percentage of the 911 calls that yes. were people experiencing homelessness? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and Director Herman, I guess my last question is that you, perfect timing. Uh, on the pilot, it, it's very interesting to hear about the pilot um, that will, uh, I guess, begin sometime this spring coming up. Um, the pilot, uh, I'm assuming that's gonna be a 24 by seven operation? The pilot is actually gonna be 16 hours a day because there's a tremendous drop off after um, early morning hours of how many of these calls come in. So we're maximizing the number of calls that these teams can respond to uh, for 16 hours a day. And okay, if and it turns out that, that it makes more sense to staff at 24 hours a day, we can look at that going forward. But one of the things that we will learn during the pilot is whether the staffing levels are appropriate. Okay, and to that point, how many, uh, how many people per team? There'll be three people per team, two EMTs and one social worker. Okay. And then there are supervisors that are available on both sides, on the EMS side and the health and hospital side. Okay. I'm just curious also, um, the, you mentioned the um, NYC well, the, um, the three-digit um, hotline, what is the experience of the people responding to those calls? What are so, so some of them are peers, people with lived experience, either with substance misuse or mental illness. And some of them are social workers. And what is the, uh, I guess my last question is gonna go along those lines. I guess something along the lines of um, time expired positivity rate or rate of help anybody that's led to get uh, subsequent help from those calls. Myla, can you talk about the experience of the mobile crisis teams? There's the then again reminding you that half of them, ten thousand a year, come from NYC Well, and about ten thousand a year come from hospitals are dispatched by hospitals and healthcare providers. So let's just talk about the NYC well version. So thank you very much for the question. I, I, you're asking about NYC well in general, when, when they refer to a mobile crisis team, which is um, not often out of all of the calls that they get, the mobile crisis teams um, are very successful at de-escalating the situation on the ground um, and will uh, rarely need to um, have somebody get a level of care like in the hospital situation. I'm not sure if that's the question you were asking. The question was, well, I guess, so I guess the question was more along the lines of follow-up, you know, yeah. follow-up care. So from NYC Well, for those people that are asking for referrals okay. and information, they, th those referrals are made. They are giving, they are either um, giving the information directly to the person on the other end of the line, or they are helping to make uh, the referral directly. And about half of the calls that come through are for information and referrals. Okay, about half, okay, thank, okay. Susan, you had something else to add? I'm sorry, I don't wanna cut you off. Uh, no. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Adams. And it looks like we've been rejoined by Council Member Amphrey Samuel. So um, as soon as the host unmutes her, we will turn back to her. 
Starting time. Hi. I live in Brownsville. My internet sucks. Um, so I'll just jump right into, um, I probably didn't need to go all into all that other stuff. I'll just read what I was um, going to say. In October 2019, 33-year-old Kwesi Ashun was shot and killed by police officers. His sister, Amma Bartley, told us that she had been trying to get a mental health support since 2004 when he was first diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Without steady health insurance and primary health care, Kwesi continued to decline. For 15 years, Amma was in contact with the Department of Health, the mobile crisis unit, and other public outlets that she thought would be a resource, but nobody gave him the treatment or support that Kwesi needed. In fact, the response was always to call 911 if he became violent. And that's exactly what they did. They called 911 until the final call resulted in Kwesi losing his life in October of 2019 at the age of 33 by NYPD. And I know we talked a lot about what's going to happen and changes in policy and procedures, but I just want to get like just a quick response. Um, what can I tell Ama and her family today that would um, be different from what they experienced for so many years and where we are as a city in New York today? Like everything that you said, there was a lot of technical um, information. Um, but what can I say that's just simple to a family um, like Alma and Kwesi, what they went through, what they were experiencing? What can I tell them today about where we are as a city? First, first these, any, any situation, all of the situations that you described and others described, these are tragic situations and they're horrible for everyone who's lived through it and they're horrible for all of us. The, what you can say I believe is that we've made a lot of progress trying to find new ways to help people like him so that he does stay connected to care, both through mobile treatment, both through more locations all around the city, New York care that would have provided insurance for him. And you can say that when emergencies do occur, the city is moving towards having a health-centered approach with health EMS and social workers responding to somebody like him. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. And we now turn to council member Riley to ask questions. You can begin as soon as the host unmutes you. Thank you. Starting time. Thank you, council. And I would like to congratulate Chair Lewis uh, for leading us through this uh, committee. Um, it's very imperative, especially during the time we're going through right now uh, through the pandemic. I would like to thank the panel uh, for their testimony. I would like to thank my partner in the Bronx, uh, Councilman Ayala, for that wonderful legislation. Uh, I just have uh, two questions. It seems like accessibility to mental health services within our communities uh, seems to be an issue. Uh, for instance, I had a, a constituent call me this weekend who's going through mental health um, problems with his son, and he doesn't know which direction to go to. Um, I did hear you um, state, uh, Mrs. Herman, that um, we're working with the NYPD, health and hospitals, um, and other um, municipal organizations. But my question is, how can we better involve community-based organizations um, with accessibility to mental health services to our communities, um, residents within our communities. And the next question is to the NYPD. Uh, 160,000 mental health calls. Did we see a, a significant spike with mental health calls um, since last year due to the pandemic? So for the first question, council member, I thank you for that question. I, it can be overwhelming for anybody to try and find a, a, the right service for somebody that you're worried about. It can be really um, just difficult and challenging because you're worried so much about somebody. And that, that's why we have expanded NYC Well the way we have. The website that NYC Well, if I'm correct, I believe it's been visited 400,000 times. Do you have that, the website figure, Mila? But the 
the they've taken you know answered 200,000 calls texts and chats just during the pandemic alone and we think of it as our gateway to behavioral health services it's a place that somebody can call to get help right then in the moment and as Myla said they can talk to a peer if they want to talk to a peer but they can also get a referral and they can say, I wanna be near home. I wanna be near work. I want it to be in this neighborhood because I always visit my family there or, or I'm calling about someone else that I care about. Can you help me figure out the best way to get help for that person? And that's what NYC Well is all about. That's why you know, sometimes people are calling and they need urgent response right away in person that's when they dispatch the mobile crisis teams. But so many, the overwhelming majority of the calls are for people who need help in the moment and talking helps them or texting, chatting helps them or they get a referral. They, can, they, they need to talk to somebody and they wanna to talk to somebody on an ongoing basis or they wanna hand a name of a person to someone they care about. That's what NYC is all about and they do it very, very well, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we would look forward to working with you and every council member to make sure that in addition to all the texts that the city sends out and the, the billboards and the posters and the announcements that you get out in any way you can, when you send out emails to your constituents, when you put out publications, that you have a little summary from us that describes what NYC Well does um, and help inform your constituents. I think from all the work that we've done over the years, we know that rather than just say to somebody, if you, if you need to, um, if you have a mental health issue, call NYC Well, it's a much better exchange if you can say, if you have a behavioral health issue, call NYC Well, because this is what they do. This yeah. is what they offer. And we have write-ups like that. We've distributed them before. We're happy to distribute it again. And um, any, any way we can let New Yorkers know, more New Yorkers know about NYC well, we're happy to do that. Thank and you, Anna. If, if you could please send some information like that to my office so I could distribute that, that would be you know, well we appreciated. We will do that. I'd also be happy to meet with you, to talk to you as I did Chair Lewis, this past week, I'd be happy to meet with you and tell you a little bit about some of the services that are available in your district. Um, what's there on the ground that you can tell your constituents about. Um, maybe we could hear from the police department about whether there was a spike in calls, mental health calls during the pandemic. The calls for um, mental people and mental health crisis. Time expired. Increased. I'm sorry, I didn't hear, you said decreased? Increased. Increased, thank you. And do you have by percentage or no? Uh, sure, uh, we, uh, in 2020, we had 161,000, uh, 268 compared to 171,490 in 2019. So thank you. The, the pandemic being the better part of 2020. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Council Member Riley. And we'll now turn back to Chair Lewis, who will continue with questions. And just again, as a reminder to Council Members, you can use the Zoom raise hand function if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so there was a, a lot of um, information that was shared and many responses in regards to who's doing what when it comes to this new system. But I wanted to know who is the coordinator between all of, all of uh, these systems in the city? Like, who are, is everybody gonna be speaking to one another? How does this information come together? Let's particularly talk about the new mobile crisis team. Uh, does EMT speak with H&H &H and everyone else and how does all that information get collectively put in one place? So, so EMS, the, the new mobile response, mobile mental health response teams will be jointly managed by H&H &H and FDNY EMS. And they 
talk to each other multiple times a day when they will be co-located. Some of the, the teams will have a base where they are co-located. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're very much in communication and it's a, it's a you know, jointly run operation. But the data that they're collecting as they're going out all the time, where is that information being placed? What does the follow-up look like? Because I know you mentioned like in two months, we'll have some type of outcome. And I would love to know where that information is going to be shared. But where are they placing all that, all that data? So the EMTs have a data collection system that they've used forever. And the social workers at h, &H the same. So they will be sharing information. We'll also be using some of the NYPD data to make sure that we know what percentage of the calls are going to these teams. So there are multiple agencies involved here and we will be sharing information and analyzing data as, as needed regularly. And where would that information uh, be given in two months after the pilot is over? Well, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not going to give you a hard and fast date that it's over in two months. I'm saying we will have learned a lot in two months and we will hope to expand as soon as possible. But just to be clear, I wouldn't say the pilot's over. We'll, we will probably be modifying it on a regular basis, even as we expand. And some of the metrics that I mentioned in my testimony, those metrics will be reported publicly. All right, we look forward to seeing that. Um, what's the current, this is for NYPD, what's the current average response time to mental health emergencies in New York City? And does that always involve the NYPD? They're muted. There we go. Uh, I don't have the uh, average response times for mental health emergencies with me, um, but I can get that for you. All right, we would appreciate that. Yeah. And another question for NYPD, how many officers are currently trained in crisis intervention training? And we wanted to know where are you placing that data for those that are trained? So I think we've trained about 16,000 officers on crisis, uh, crisis intervention training. At this point, it was suspended uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, it's a four day course. So that number has been pretty static, but we are hoping to begin again, but it's about 16,000 officers. It's over 16,000, and I believe that the numbers are posted on Thrive's website. Right. Uh, CIT is one of the programs that's overseen by Thrive. And um, as I mentioned, we have reach data and impact data for all of our programs on our website, regularly updated. All right, thank you for that. We'll be checking out for that. I just wanted to go back really quickly to the mobile crisis team. What kind, what kind of aftercare and wraparound services or referral services are being offered to the pilot participants um, once the crisis is stabilized? So Ch Chair Lewis, I just wanna make a distinction between the, the mobile crisis teams that already exist that are offering referrals. And as Dr. Harrison said, often stay with somebody two or three times, they can go back, they can visit. Mm. The, the teams that we are creating now, the new mental health response teams, those teams will be focusing primarily on de-escalation, assessment of both physical and mental health needs. And we hope to, in short order, be developing connections to follow-up care, but that we, we will, that will likely be in sort of phase two of pilot. But our hope is that we will be using many of the resources of heat teams, of community-based organizations, of H&H, &H, outpatient clinics, the resources that are there, the Support and Connection Center. We hope to be using many resources to provide follow-up. I look forward to that because I think that's part of the issue. There's some type of response, but the follow-up um, always lacks. So I look forward to seeing that information. Um, were these, were the neighborhoods, were their neighborhoods uh, known to have existing gaps in access to treatment that the new pilot is working with? This, this zone was chosen because it has a very high volume of mental health crisis calls. So we knew that we would have enough calls to see whether this approach made a lot of sense. 
It was also chosen because the East Harlem Support and Connection Center is there. And so we will be able to, it's small, so we won't be able to have a lot of people go there, but we will be able to have some, offer it to some people. You only go there on a voluntary basis, but they do both um, residential and non-residential work with people. And during COVID, they're at about half capacity. So it, it will not be for many people, but we'll be able to use it. And there's a rich array of community-based outpatient work in that, in that zone. All right, and how can we better address gaps in mental health services, particularly in black and brown communities? I think this is a, a problem that's persisted for a long time. It's something we're dedicated to working on. We, are, we focus very much on trying to promote greater equity and access to healthcare. And that's one reason why we locate the site-based services in these communities that are, there's often a real connection between race and poverty and lack of services. And so 70% of our services are located in those communities. It's also why we think about reaching people in different contexts, not just having a brick and mortar clinic where someone has to go, but providing mobile services, providing services in your local community by connecting with primary care providers and having them know where they can access mental health care for someone that they're working with otherwise. Sometimes you have a trusted primary care provider and if they know where to refer you to, that's a, that's a, a good way to access services. So we're trying to reach people in a number of ways. And we believe that this kind of effort is turning the tide, that more and more people are connected, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Of course, so we, I hope to see that information in the report um, after this pilot is over to ensure that we are including more black and brown communities and that there's a better outcome um, due to this new piloted program. That is all the questions I have. Do we have any other council members that have questions? It seems that uh, there are no council members with further questions. Uh, Chair Lewis, I don't know if you wanted to make a quick closing remark for the administration before we turn to the next panel. I just wanted to let you, uh, thank you to all of you who, who came this morning to testify, to answer questions um, and to share more information about the trajectory and how things are going. We look forward to a follow-up, a swift follow-up um, in regards to the pilot program. I hope that uh, Public Advocate Williams and Councilmember Ayala can get your support on their bills. It's, it's really important that we think, we think forward because what we have now has not been working. And I think that's evident. So this is the opportunity for us to do something better and to really um, help the mental health community. So thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you. We look forward to working with you. Thank you very much to this panel. And we're now gonna to turn to public testimony. A quick procedural matter, all public testimony will be limited to two minutes, but written testimony can be submitted and will be read in its entirety. After I call your name, please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel in order will be Juhan Diabasa Sen, Zainab Tawil, Joy Luang Faze, and Yuna Yoon. Um, and so we'll give the host a moment to unmute these panelists. And as soon as you're ready and the sergeant cues you, Ju Han, you may begin your testimony. Starting time. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Chair Lewis and the committee members for holding this important hearing. Uh, my name is Ju Han. I'm the Deputy Director of the Asian American Federation. We represent the collective voice of more than 70 Asian nonprofits serving 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. Um, we want to recognize C Councilmember Ayala and Lewis's bill, an effort in addressing violence against communities of color with the introduction of bill number 2210. It val validates a need in our communities for immediate response to mental health incidents led and guided by mental health professionals who employ mitigation tactics to keep affected persons safe and not criminalize them for having mental health needs. And we also appreciate that this bill acknowledges the importance of community-based organizations that are already doing the critical work of supporting individuals seeking connections to care. 
We know the Asian community and communities as a whole, communities of color as a whole have been really hit hard by the pandemic. Asian small businesses are struggling to survive, hit early and harder due to anti-Asian xenophobia. Our um, seniors don't have enough food to eat and are, are suffering from severe isolation. And our community has experienced the highest rates of unemployment across all racial, racial groups in New York City. And adding to the mental health burden is a surge in anti-Asian violence that's not being adequately addressed. There has been about 500 bias incidents against Asian New Yorkers in the past year. Past few weeks alone, there have been people um, who've been violently slashed across the face or pushed to the ground. Um, and we know that these incidents are underreported because of um, multiple barriers that exist. Um, and the Asian community uh, is about 16% of the New York population. And we have the highest poverty rates, but also 70% of us are immigrants and 50% of us have limited English proficiency. And we know that poverty and uh, mental health, there's a cor correlation between the two. And because of decultural stigma and language diversity in our community, um, that it's that much harder to get services. And especially we have low utilization rates in our community, um, especially for models like New York City Well, which uh, the latest report shows that New York City, Asian New Yorkers rarely utilize. Um, and some of our partners um, who are testifying with me today are also um, providing some of these um, community-based responses. And we're asking the council to incorporate some of these recommendations. Staffing must, staffing must prioritize the hiring of culturally competent Asian staff who not only speak the top Asian languages, but also trained in outreach and service approaches that are familiar and not threatening to Asian immigrants. City must invest in and prioritize <clears throat> Asian CBOs that are already doing the work, enabling to hire culturally competent mental health providers, providing mental health communication, uh, mental health education. Um, and this is really important because, because Connections to Care has to meet both immediate mental health crises and offer pre preventative measures to mitigate crises in the first place. And these groups will be critical to offering aftercare and wraparound services. And in light of the uptick in anti-Asian violence, this new office, such, this office should also ensure that individuals who are impacted by persons with mental illness be connected to culturally competent mental health services immediately following cases of assault and for a period of time thereafter. On behalf of the Federation, I want to thank you for letting us speak about COVID's impact on our community and we look forward to working with all of you to ensure Asian New Yorkers are safe and secure in our own city. Thank you very much. Um, and just a reminder to council members that you can use the Zoom raise hand function to ask questions for the end of each panel. We'll now hear from our next panelist, Dia Basu Sen. You may begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Starting time. Thank you for convening and for your time today. I'm Dia Basu Sen, Executive Director of SEPNA NYC. SEPNA is the only community-based organization in the Bronx that offers linguistically accessible and culturally attuned programming and services to the Pan-South Asian community in Bangla, Siliti, Hindi, and Urdu. We support Council Member Ayala's bill to better address mental health crises. And we call on the council to ensure that if created, the Office of Community Mental Health Centers language access and cultural competence, creating partnerships with and investing in the CBOs, including APA-led and serving CBOs who are poised to ensure that our most vulnerable communities are not left behind. While our APA communities are growing by leaps and bounds, our needs are often left behind when it comes to both truly accessible services and investment of city dollars. Access to mental health services and the stigma surrounding it are a significant issue in the South Asian community. Imagine being a survivor of domestic violence and having to speak through a language line using an interpreter who may or may not speak your dialect to get counseling. Being able to express ourselves in the language that most fully conveys the depth and nuance of our hopes and ideas, our frustrations and problems is essential for quality mental health services. However, it isn't just language barrier that poses a problem. It's also a lack of digital literacy and access in our communities and not having providers who understand the intricacies of the cultural context that informs both your experiences and your need. Imagine having to explain a partition and how the intergenerational trauma is still impacting your family or the intricacies of the South Asian multi-generational joint family dynamic before being able to delve into the issues you're having at home. A lack of culturally competent, linguistically accessible mental health services means that even for those community members who've managed to overcome the stigma surrounding seeking help, it's nearly impossible to find affordable, accessible, and appropriate care. Um, I thank you for your, for your time today and the efforts to really address the mental health crisis in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to our next panelist, Zainab Tawil. You may begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Starting time. Hello, everybody. Chairperson Ayala, members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. 
I want to thank you all for the opportunity to testify before you here today. My name is Zainab Tawil. I'm the pro Domestic Violence Program Manager um, and the Community Mental Health Organizer with the Arab American Association of New York. Mohammed Bah was many things to many people, a son, a brother, an honor student, and a friend. When his mother called an ambulance to assist him during a mental health crisis on September 25th, 2012, the NYPD officers who actually responded to her call saw him very differently. Without the training or knowledge of how to properly respond to his mental health crisis, they did what they, did, what they do far too often and ended his life. Almost a decade later, New York's Arab and Muslims live in the shadows of Mr. Bas killing, but we know his case is far from unique. To say that there's a profound mental health crisis in New York's Arab American community would be an understatement. The lack of access to mental health care available to Arab Americans and the stigma surrounding access has done a great deal of harm in our community. For years, families and lives have been irreparably damaged as a result of the lack of access to affordable and culturally sensitive mental health um, care for Arab Americans. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 epidemic, these challenges have intensified severely. Families and individuals in our community are starting to crack under the pressure of loss of income, um, at home schooling, domestic quarantine, and countless other mental health stressors caused by COVID-19. Lack of access to mental health care has created a crisis but in our community, but the NYPD's response to this crisis has created a string of tra tragedies, both small and large, and it is time for this to end. Um, as almost always, the NYPD is the first and too often only lifeline women in these situations have, or sorry, individuals in these situations have. Um, for example, when an instance of domestic abuse is responded to by law enforcement, they're often untrained to handle these situations and risk everyone involved. Um, Time expired. Ultimately, ultimately, I'm sorry, my testimony was so long, but um, ultimately, we just want to say that our city's response to mental health crises has destroyed many lives across domestic violence and mental health crises, but it doesn't have to do for much longer. This bill, along with many others making their way through city council, will have a profound impact on countless lives, and I strongly urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We next turn to Joy Luang Faze. You may begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Thank you. Starting time. Good afternoon, my name is Joy Long Pasai. I'm the Assistant Executive Director at Hamilton Madison House. We are a nonprofit settlement house located in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. We are also the largest outpatient behavioral health provider for Asian Americans on the East Coast. Currently, we operate five mental health clinics, a personalized recovery oriented service program, and a supportive housing program for individuals with severe mental health in two locations in Manhattan and Queens. Our staff are bilingual and we provide services for the Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Cambodian, and Vietnamese community. In the last decade, Asian Americans continue to be one of the gro fastest growing population in the New York metropolitan area. Approximately 70% of the Asians in New York City are immigrants. Currently in, in Hamilton Madison House behavioral health programs, including our mental health and addiction services, 80% of our program clients identify as first generation immigrants. For Asian Americans, access to emergency care is already challenged by a variety of factor, factors from low, lower utilization rates because of cultural stigma and cultural not, not having enough cultural linguistic competent providers. In the case of an emergency, it, it should be expected that incidents of mental health difficulties will arise and it will be wise for us to plan in advance to employ creative strategies for additional mental health workers and training all emergency responders to respond appropriately, including being culturally sensitive to the community members. As the number of COVID-19 and anti-Asian violent crimes occur, so did the symptoms of anxiety and depression. In our mental health clinics, we saw a 25% increase of referrals since 20, March 2020, many of the clients seeking emergency mental health services. Hamilton Madison House supports the bill in creating an Office of Community Mental Health and Citywide Mental Health Emergency Response Protocol. However, we would like to make the following recommendations in the bill. Due to the stigma of mental health services in the Asian community, please make resources available in various languages and have culturally competent and linguistically professionals respond in the emergency. I'm Incre Increase capacity for community-based providers to integrate aftercare support services after an emergency response is, is, um, is um, implemented so individuals can also obtain continued care. 
it would be crucial to develop creative strategies to employ additional mental health workers to organizations experiencing an increase of demand for current aftercare support services. HMA goes in a great length to customize our services in ways that brings familiarity and trust among our clients and participants. Support should also include um, funds to permit the hiring of multilingual staff as well to cover expenses associated with, associated with engaging graduate students requiring a sponsorship. It is also imperative that resources are also allocated to community-based organizations that have the trust in the communities to educate and encourage those in need of accessing emergency support. Lastly, collaborate with CBOs to provide training and education to emergency responders and increase partnerships among the agencies. Additionally, during emergency responses, many community nonprofit providers are compelled to take financial risks in providing services in response to an emergency. Please develop clear policies to cover expenses that extend beyond the scope of services already in effect. Hamilton Madison House supports the Committee on Immigration and Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addictions and thank the committee members and in introduced a very important bill to address the growing need for culture competence emergency services to the community. Thank you very much. And we'll turn to the final panelist for this panel, Yuna Yoon. You may begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Starting time. Okay, it looks like this panelist may be having some technical issues so we can turn back to them um, as soon as it's resolved. Um, and again, a reminder to the council members that you can use the Zoom raise hand function if you have any questions. Uh, Chair Lewis, will you be asking any questions for this panel? Not at this time, no. Thank you. Um, and I believe that Joy Luang Faze may be reading testimony for the panelists that dropped off. So as soon as the host unmutes her, we can begin. Starting time. Um, I'm sorry, I, this is Joy. I'm not reading a testimony. Um, if you could unmute Ms. Yoon, that would be um, great. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name was just under Joy. Um, so uh, my name is Yuna Yoon. Um, I am Assistant Director at Korean Community Services. Thank you, Council Chair Farrell Lewis and Council Members Ampri Samuel, Borelli Cabrera and Riley for this opportunity to advocate for the mental health clinic at KCS. We're the only state licensed clinic in New York highlighting the Korean targeting the Korean population, also the youngest department in a nonprofit that's currently 48 years old. We have trust in the community and play a vital role in crisis response, taking hospital referrals and connecting clients to higher level of care and providing culturally and linguistically appropriate therapy and medication management services. The policy of our clinic is that anyone in the community with a mental health issue should be seen and the discretionary fund helps us uphold that policy. At the same time, we continue to have a wait list as funding has been cut for us to increase our capacity when the need has increased. Though we provide medications and therapy and connect clients, to, clients with other services at KCS, we cannot provide the extent of support some clients need, such as with substance abuse. Transitioning into and now thinking of how to transition out of telehealth is a constant struggle, as is finding ways to help our clients beyond telehealth. We also want to increase our impact through outreach and providing spaces to heal around issues that impact all communities, such as our collective grief and loss from COVID, and the complex and multi-layered wounds arising from racism. As assistant director and a licensed clinical social worker who sees a couple of the clients at the clinic myself, through my work and my own identity as a Korean American, I can attest that healing does not happen in a vacuum. In these isolating times, while communities mourn loss and struggle for resources, we must do so together. The stories we would otherwise miss due to language barriers speak to this as clients work through their isolation, shame, external and internalized depressions and traumas arising from immigration, intergenerational wounds, and racism. Messages we receive from the media on anti-Asian violence by select individuals amplify a collective fear, distress, anxiety, and depression that can lead to um, backlash and contribute to the spike of during COVID of substance abuse, domestic violence, and suicides. We need mental health treatment through the 
lens of restorative justice to facilitate lasting and community-wide healing. And that requires tangible and intangible resources in the form of increased funding and collaboration between communities that make it clear to everyone that supporting the APA community would support other communities and vice versa in this inevitably interconnected city that has demonstrated so much resilience to its history. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panelist. Uh, we'll just wait a moment to see if any council members will have questions. Seeing none, we can thank this panel and move on to the next panel. The next panel will be Hawa Ba, Nadia Chait, Cal Hedigan, and Joyce Kendrick. Uh, and we'll begin as soon as the host unmutes this panel and the sergeant cues you. So Hawa Ba, you will be beginning this panel. Thank you. Starting time. Hi, I'm obviously not Mrs. Ba. Um, I'm Yul Son Lim from the Justice Committee. I'm going to read Mrs. Ba's testimony uh, because she was not unable to make this time yesterday. Uh, the council actually went back on an agreement to have Mr. Vassal and Mrs. Ba speak before admin because they found out that the family actually opposed uh, uh, Bill uh, 20, I'm sorry, 2210. Um, so this is her testimony. Uh, my name is Hawa Ba. I am the mother of Mohammed Ba. Mohammed was killed by the NYPD in 2012. In 2012, Mohammed was depressed and didn't sound like himself. I flew all the way from Guinea to try to help him. I tried to get him into different programs, but everyone told me you have to call 911 if you want medical help. On September 25th, 2012, I called 911, but NYPD came first. They forced their way into my son's home, even though I begged them not to, and shot and killed him execution style. The jury for the civil suit found Officer Mateo used excessive force and, and Lieutenant Lucitra failed to supervise, but they weren't fired. These officers should be fired and the NYPD must be removed from any mental health response, especially in black communities. I wanna tell you why I oppose bill number 2210. Two, First, sending NYPD and a mental health team together will not work. We have to remove police completely. Even the 911 system must be removed from NYPD's control. I'm against what you call co-response teams and any police response when someone needs medical care. Second, there needs to be accountability for officers who hurt or kill people or break protocol, but this bill does not ensure that. Third, the bill does not help us prevent crises. It, it, it ignores that there's almost no mental health services specifically for black communities. The city council should defund the NYPD so that money can go to the services we need. We need jobs, housing, education, health services that treat us with dignity, not more I'm training inspired. and more money for the police. Fourth, the bill doesn't say anything about getting input from families like mine whose children have been killed by police and those who've struggled with mental health issues who've been targeted by the NYPD. But you need our input to get, uh, to get this right. I'm, uh, today, I'm here to say intro uh, 2210 will not save lives of people like my son, Mohammed Ba, and also Mateo and Lucitra should be fired. I pray that you will listen to me and other families who oppose this bill. Thank you very much. The next panelist will be Nadia Chait. Nadia, you can begin as soon as the, the sergeant cues you. Starting time. Thank you. I'm Nadia Chait. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. We represent over 100 community-based mental health and substance use providers who collectively serve over 600,000 New Yorkers annually. And one of the key concerns for our members is the criminalization of individuals with mental health and substance use challenges. So we're very pleased to see the council has tackled these issues in the hearing today and with the two bills that have been proposed. We think both bills take important steps to change our city's response to mental health crises and ensure that individuals who need mental health care or substance use care receive that care rather than a public health, a public safety response that at best results in them feeling criminalized and at worst results in tragic circumstances, including their death. Um, I'm gonna focus my remarks today on intro 2222. Um, we think this is a, very much a step in the right direction um, and really appreciate the council taking a look at this issue. We would encourage the hotline to be 988 since that's happening at the federal and at the state level. We think it's critical 
that uh, the numbers be the same so that individuals know what number to call and aren't confused between two numbers. Um, the bill addresses the need for public outreach and we would just second that that is going to be critically important to get individuals to call this number. Um, certainly outreach to individuals like those we serve who we think will relatively quickly adapt to this number, but particularly to members of the public who may be seeing someone on the street um, or seeing someone on the subway in crisis, we need them to know that this number exists. And we also need to make sure that when those members of the public do call 911, which of course will happen, that those calls are appropriately sent to 988. So we would encourage significant training of the 911 dispatchers to ensure that these calls um, are forwarded to 988 when appropriate. Um, lastly, on intro 2210, uh, we really support the inclusion of peers. We think that's a key part of the model. Um, and Time expired. we look forward to discussing more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Cal Hedigan. You can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Starting time. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Lewis and members of the committee for convening this hearing. My name is Cal Hedigan, and I'm the CEO of Community Access, an organization that has long been in the forefront of efforts to transform our mental health system into one where the voices and perspectives of people living with mental health concerns are centered. Community Access is proud to be a founding member of the Correct Crisis Intervention Today in New York City Coalition, or CCIT NYC. I ask you to please direct your attention to my written testimony, which goes into greater detail than time allows for this morning. I will focus on two key areas that must be addressed regarding the legislation before the committee. Intro 2210 does not go far enough to remove police from mental health crisis response. The term public safety emergency is too broadly defined within the legislation. As written, almost anything could be defined as a public safety emergency, thus leading the NYPD to be dispatched, contrary to the very goal of this reform effort. Given how many times police responses to mental health crisis calls have resulted in violence or death, the importance of crafting legislation, legislation which ensures that police are not dispatched to mental health crisis cannot be overstated. Secondly, while I applaud the inclusion of peers as members of the proposed response teams, I am deeply concerned by the lack of involvement of peers and impacted communities throughout other components of the bill. Peers and impacted communities must be at the center of every aspect of these reforms, most critically in the development of re-envisioned emergency response protocols. As written, 2210 does not incorporate those whose expertise is necessary to realize deep transformation in how our city responds to people experiencing mental health crises. I I'm believe- inspired. I believe 2210 contains elements that could move us to a more just and compassionate health only mental health emergency response system, but requires significant changes in order to realize that intention. Thank you for your attention to this important issue. Lives are at stake. Thank you very much. We'll now turn to Joyce Kendrick. You can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Starting time. Good morning to all. My name is Joyce Kendrick, and I am the attorney in charge of the mental health representation team of the criminal defense practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. I want to thank the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and in particular, Chair Diana Ayala, for holding this important hearing on the city's response to mental health emergencies. For too long, our city has relied on policing and jails to address issues of mental illness and substance abuse. It is a fact that individuals experiencing a mental health crisis are more likely to be engaged by police than medical providers. This involvement of police too often leads to disastrous consequences for the person that help was summoned for. BDS supports intro 2210 and intro 2021 in relation to creating an office of community mental health and a citywide mental health emergency response protocol. The creation of a mental health emergency response protocol will provide people in crisis 
and their loved ones comfort because they will know that it was devised by mental health specialists. This will certainly encourage families to seek assistance before a situation escalates. The spirit of this legislation is to remove NYPD from mental health responses, recognizing that the traumatic and sometimes fatal consequences of an NYPD response. In our written comments, we offer several suggestions for strengthening this legislation. Specifically, including people with mental illness, their loved ones, and mental health advocates in the emergency response planning process, and creating measures to ensure that NYPD does not respond to mental health emergencies, and if they do become involved, that there is a review of the incident and a process to hold officers accountable if they are found to have escalated the Time situation. Expired. As written, this bill is unclear concerning what will happen if NYPD inappropriately responds or escalates the situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as a reminder to all panelists that you can submit written testimony of any length and it will be read in its entirety. Um, I'm gonna pause a moment to see if any council members have questions for this panel. Seeing none, we can turn to the next panel, which will be Ruth Lowenkron, Fiona O'Grady, Melissa Moore, and Gary Stankowski. Ruth Lowenkron, you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Starting time. Good morning. Thank you very much. Ruth Lowenkron, Director of Disability Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And we too are active members of CCIT NYC, Correct Crisis Intervention Today, New York City, an organization of over 80 other organizations. And I have to tell you, we are greatly disappointed by the legislation. And to the extent that there was a lot of talk about the Thrive Pilot, we've let Susan Herman know that we are disappointed in that as well. Yes, there are things that are good about both of those, but one problem is that the people who really know what needs to happen for people with mental disabilities, our groups that have had focus groups and have had over 100 families in two different sessions talking about this, we're not really listened to. We had the highest hopes. We spoke with the public advocate. I must say the public advocate's report is amazing, but this legislation is far from amazing. It is a great disappointment because in huge part, it would let the police in at just about any matter. And that is because it uses an overly broad definition of public safety emergency. When you're saying that can include any crime in progress, any type of violence, any act likely to harm the public, we are making that definition way too broad. The good news, we think this can be remedied. We will sit with you and help you remedy it. We are also very concerned about the role that's been assigned to DOHMH. We do not think that any kind of a program of this sort should be housed within a city agency. The city agency should in fact be contracting out with not-for-profit organizations as many have said. And this is in, to talk about the CAHOOTS model. That is something that the CAHOOTS model of course does as well. We are also terribly, terribly upset with the thought that we are I'm talking tired. about a, a 30 minute response time. Where does that come from? How is that acceptable? You can talk about emergencies, urgent, as, as, as Commissioner Herman did. But when you are talking about emergencies, as this bill does, you cannot say you're going to respond to an emergency for people with mental disabilities in far greater time than the eight to 10 minutes that you do typically now. So uh, there are things about this, as others have said, that are also good. We're very excited about the hotline. We're very excited about the inclusion of peers. We're very excited about the reporting responses. We can get into that. This could be salvaged, but the police issue has got to go. That's your goal to get the police out of there. This does not do that. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Fiona O'Grady. You can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Starting time. 
Hello there. My name is Fiona O'Grady, and on behalf of Samaritan Suicide Prevention Centre, a member of the world's oldest and largest suicide prevention network with centres in 40 countries, we thank the committee and especially Chair Farrah Lewis, who I'm very pleased to continue to work with, having worked in her district, and also to see that Councilmember Ayala and others are here today. Um, it's no secret that suicide and self-harming behaviour were significant public health problems before COVID-19, and that the number of New Yorkers at risk has significantly increased, in some cases doubled and tripled during the pandemic. As, as the New York City community-based organization whose sole mission is the preventing of suicide and saving of lives, Samaritan supports and encourages the City Council to expand and enhance the quality of and access to New York City's crisis response and suicide prevention services. Hoping to contribute to the success of the Council's legislative goals, Samaritans would like to share what we've learned over 40 years um, and some of the unintended consequences that resulted from the development of previous new suicide prevention initiatives. Most striking, frequently when new citywide suicide prevention programs were created, there was a corresponding reduction in the budgets and abilities of those community-based organizations that were already entrenched in New York City's diverse communities to provide care and support to those at risk. We saw this with the launch of Thrive, which resulted in dozens of community-based organizations that were successfully providing essential crisis services, having their budgets dramatically reduced. Samaritans is one example, operating New York City's only confidential 24-hour suicide hotline for over 30 years, answering 1.3 million calls in that time. DOHMH cut our contract by 85%. We were not the only ones. It does not help to add if you subtract at the same time to create the new at the cost of the old. Also, with due respect to our friends at New York City uh, DOHMH, who we hold in highest regard, no matter the intent, you can have an alternative to yourself. So um, we obviously encourage seeking help, and we would also like you to consider putting new services under a different umbrella than the department that already oversees the majority of city mental health initiatives. But no matter how you proceed, as the organization that created the world's first suicide hotline 70 years ago, Samaritans offers the council our help, our expertise, our support, as new initiatives, which we do support, are devoted to helping New Yorkers um, in their time of crisis. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We'll next turn to Melissa Moore. Starting time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at today's much needed hearing. For decades, we've watched as policing has played a pivotal role in the racist drug war and how resources have been funneled into law enforcement instead of vital services that make our communities safer. In too many cases, drugs and also mental health issues have been used by the NYPD, the largest and most militarized police force in the United States, as an excuse to target, harass, and assault and kill Black New Yorkers. This certainly occurs in response to co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. New York City absolutely has to act in this historic moment to fundamentally change the paradigm around policing in New York and responses to these issues. Even low-level contact with law enforcement has lasting negative effects, um, both in physical and mental health consequences for people. In fact, in 2019, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene released a research brief summarizing the findings that the criminal justice system and policing overall negatively impact New Yorkers' physical and mental health, warning the public that contact with the criminal legal system, everything from police stops or searches or other interactions, poses a public health risk. As we're discussing today addressing mental health issues, we absolutely have to look at this data that shows the NYPD itself has a huge impact in harming New Yorkers' mental health and well being. Um, the New York City Council should instead invest in evidence based resources for people and New Yorkers all across our city instead of investing in law enforcement and continuing to use law enforcement in the response. These programs have to be built on sound research and evidence and be trauma informed and culturally and gender competent. We have a shared goal of ensuring that New Yorkers do not die at the hands of the NYPD, but we have serious concerns about this bill's ability to accomplish this goal. There absolutely cannot be carve outs for the NYPD to respond to mental health or substance use calls. In our work around drug enforcement, we've seen unfortunately how these sorts of carve outs for public safety emergencies unfortunately have led to horrific outcomes due to racism, Time discrimination expired. and incorrect assumptions. Just a couple of weeks ago, a video emerged of NYPD officers harassing and arresting a man 
who had just nodded out on a street in Harlem. When community members tried to intervene, the officers became belligerent toward them and referred to the person that they were arresting in absolutely horrible stigmatic terms. For the safety of New Yorkers, we need to fully remove the NYPD from these responses. They have to be extracted from the equation in order to prevent harm. And furthermore, any legislation covering this intersection absolutely has to include accountability for when officers who aren't even called but might show up on the scene do not listen to the peers and to the staff who actually are part of the response teams. It must include privacy protections and also must have a clear process for decision-making that vests more power with peers so that the deference isn't necessarily to people who are from outside of communities. Overall, we cannot support an effort with these mental health aims that still involves the NYPD in response. We look forward to further conversations with the council regarding the implementation of these recommendations and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. And our final panelist on this panel will be Gary Stankowski. Uh, good afternoon. Time. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank Chair Lewis and the committee members uh, for this hearing. I'm Gary Stankowski, Chief Operating Officer at NADAP. We are a community-based social service agency with six offices in New York City. We provide care coordination to about 5,000 people each year, with the majority having co-occurring medical and mental health disorders. About half have both a medical, a mental health diagnosis and a substance use disorder. NADAP supports the council's bill to create an office of community mental health and a citywide mental health emergency response protocol to add support services to first responders and to ensure that vulnerable New Yorkers receive needed services. We ask that the city council consider the following components in, in determining the bill. Training for emergency call staff and first responders on assessing and managing behavioral health factors when responding to emergency situations. The utilization of brief assessments to identify mental health and substance use disorders. Use of video technology to add behavioral health care specialists when responding to emergency calls. Feedback and involvement from people with behavioral health disorders to help inform policy decisions. Establishing an advisory panel to provide input into the bill and establish the office and utilization of community resources for training and behavioral health services. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it looks like council member Rosenthal has some questions for this panel. So as soon as the host unmutes council member Rosenthal, we can begin with her questions. I think I'm good. Can you hear Starting me? Starting time. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Um, we can hear you. First of all, Chair Lewis, man, you, you you fit you fit the seat well. Congratulations um, on earning this chairmanship. I'm so excited to see where the committee goes under your leadership. So really want to add my congratulations to you. And I also want to thank this panel for the variety of ways you all have articulated some of the same thoughts. And it's good for us to hear about it from different perspectives. Um, so I really thank everyone. I have one specific question for the last speaker. Um, if you could just describe a little bit more what you were thinking of when you said the use of video. Um, if, I, I'm not sure it's what I think it was, but I think it sounds really interesting and I was hoping you could talk about that. Hi, this is Gary. Um, you know, with, with so many emergency calls coming in and so many needs out there, it's sometimes difficult to get um, the behavioral health specialists where they're needed uh, because it takes time to get to different locations. And even with <clears throat> the pilot that we heard today, you know, there's just a limited amount of, um, um, of, of people resources to be able to address the many situations. So I, I put that on there as a possibility to, you know, are there ways to connect first responders with the mental health person who can actually see what's going on and be able to provide feedback and let people, you know, you know guide the first responders based on what they're seeing um, in order to be able to better handle the situation. 
Got it. And my connection's pretty spotty. So if I get disconnected, just ignore it, go on to the next speaker. But can I repeat what you just said? So you're saying perhaps the NYPD, the police officer could use their body cam and be in present time connection with a behavioral health specialist who would guide that police officer uh, in, in their response. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, if police are going to continue to be involved in those responses, yes. then maybe that's right. something that can help um, with the situations because, you know, at any moment, you know, there could be, you know, dozen, a dozen of these or more going on at any given time. Yeah, I, I just think that's interesting. I mean, I tend to concur with uh, with folks who think there should be no police involved, but, um, you know, as we are waiting to figure it out, I think that's a really straightforward uh, sort of way station that uh, the city could do quite easily, I would guess. Um, and then linked to that, I, I, again, I'm really trying to be very practical about um, what people are suggesting. And, you know, the reason, so, so many years ago, EMS was actually um, a part of the Health and Hospitals Corporation. And um, about, I guess, 25 years ago, they were moved in under fire department in order to focus on an expedited response. So the, the, the um, fire people are trained now in um, some of the EMT, you know, very fast responses that need to happen. But the reason EMS gets also gets to a site so quickly is, is because of the way that EMS is geographically placed throughout the city. And I'm wondering to any of the panelists, if you think that, um, and you're using the word behavioral health specialist, so I'm just gonna use that same word, although I'm sure it has baggage um, that means something, but are you suggesting that there be a behavioral health specialist in each of the EMS uh, vehicles. Like I'm trying to get a practical understanding. Are you referring specifically to the video technology? No, this is for Fire all. Fire. This is truly for all of the panelists. I'd be interested in hearing sort of how we would, at a practical level. Like if police were no longer involved, how do we get a behavioral health specialist to the location immediately? Is it that we would add a staff person to the EMS vehicle? Or, or how do you envision how, they, how do we get people there really fast? Um, Council Member Rosenthal, um, it's Ruth Lohenkron. Um, I'd be happy to answer that question because CCIT and... Um, thank you for the opportunity. CCIT NYC, Correct Crisis Intervention Today, New York City, has a proposal. We have been working on this issue for at least uh, eight years now. And uh, of course, this issue has become much more prominent with what we're seeing with Black Lives Matter and so on. But this is something we've been working on for the longest and well before the immediate crisis before us, we came up with a proposal. And I think with all modesty, we have the answers in that we have looked around the country to see how others do this. Um, others have already spoken about cahoots in Eugene, Oregon. We think that's an excellent model and our proposal is modeled on that. And I dare say that both the Thrive model and the bill before us have elements of the cahoots model in it, but they just don't go far enough. And why I raise this at this moment, council member, is because you wanna know, does this happen? Can this happen? How can we do it without the police? 
you should know that in Eugene, Oregon, they've been running their system for over 30 years successfully with very, very few instances of even needing the police to come in. Less than 1% of the calls in all these years have brought police there. And even those very, very few calls have not resulted in any kind of injuries to the police or to um to the uh, individuals with the crisis. And one very important thing about the bill in front of us is it recognizes that if police are to come in, and of course what we say is right now, they're gonna be coming in all the time, so that's not good. But if that's very, 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 very much narrowed and the police are to come in, one of the excellent things about the bill as proposed is the recognition that the police stand back, an unusual role for the police, but that they stand back and take the directions from the mental health team on the spot. And I think that's the way that it can right. work. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm ever and, hoping... and let me be Thank honest, you. you had me at hello. Like I agree with what you're saying. I'm happy for you to repeat it, but I, I'm with you. Um, I'm not familiar with the CAHOOTS model. So could you just for one more minute uh, share um, I appreciate your patience and I won't ask any more questions after this, but if, if someone could just explain to me, how does the behavioral health specialist get to the site expeditiously? Sure, absolutely. What, what happens is in that instance, it does go through 911, but there's a lot of work being going on in Eugene to get it out of 911, as we very much propose doing here. And as the legislation, again, a part that we, we um, support would do here, get it to a different number. But be that as it may, it, re it responds as an emergency number. And what's very critical is it does the triage that is necessary, as Susan Herman suggests, well, there's urgent Emergent, there's emergent. But if it is emergent, I can assure you, and the numbers back me up, that they respond with far fewer than 30 minutes. So it is doable. They are working in the CAHOOTS model. And in, mind you, there are many other models now cropping up around the country. I just, and others refer to that because it's been in place for 30 years. But that model and others recognize that, in fact, they are the responders and they can respond with alacrity to what is obviously a crisis. And, and mind you, the police heretofore, we're not happy with how they responded because we know how many times they killed people, but we also know that they responded speedily. And that has to be an element here. And it is an element of, of cahoots. I hope I answered your question. And excuse me, council member, I'd like to also just take a minute to respond. Thank you so much for your interest and for asking this Thank important you. question. Um, I just want to say, you know, when we look at response times and how we actually make sure that the, the communities who need these resources are getting them, we have to look at the fact that the New York City budget for policing far outstrips any sort of money that's going to important health and social services. Policing receives a larger share of the city's budget than public health, homeless services, youth services, and other vital agencies combined. So when we're talking about how to make sure that the responses are going quickly and, and swiftly and that our community base, we have to make sure that the funds that are actually going to be used for social services are directed away from criminalizing New Yorkers and back into the sorts of efforts that are going to support um, community-led efforts for health and safety. I think you know communities know best what's actually going to keep their people safe and well. And so being able to work within a model that in fact gives the sort of agency back to community leaders to be able to make those distinctions. And if it's a community-based model, they're already there. It's not a matter of coming in from some other part of the city. People are there in neighborhoods, in communities already. And so I, I don't think we necessarily have to build a whole other apparatus for that piece if we're really intentional about crafting what the proposal looks like and shifting resources away from criminalization and into these much needed other efforts. 100%. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you very, very much to this panel. I'm gonna pause for another moment to see if there are other council member questions. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna turn to the next panel. Leonore Walcott, Sabrina Evans-Ellis, Beth Haroulis, and Antonine Pierre. Pierre. Leonore Walcott, we can begin with you as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. 
Good afternoon. My name is Leonor Walcott and I'm a licensed social worker and the director of youth services at Sheltering Arms. Thank you, Chair Lewis and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. Sheltering Arms is one of the largest cities, largest, excuse me, Sheltering Arms is one of the city largest providers in education, youth development, and community and family well-being programs in the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens in Brooklyn. We serve nearly 15,000 children and youth and families each year and employ more than 1,200 staff from across New York City. Sheltering Arms has served youth in foster care and runway and homeless youth systems for over two decades. Our staff provide social and emotional support and safe and st stable living environments where young people can reside free of harm. When youth are in crisis, staff are trained and equipped to meet the immediate and individual needs of youth. However, our frontline staff are not mental health professionals. If a youth is experiencing a mental health emergency, that is beyond the scope of our direct line staff. It is the difference between treating a paper cut versus a wound that requires stitches. In cases where a youth is experiencing a, psych a psychiatric crisis, the youth may be incoherent having difficulties determining what is real and what is not, delusional, disorganized thinking, experiencing hallucinations both visual and auditory, may be suicidal, could be experiencing mood instability with aggression and making life threats to harm themselves and others. At such, the safety of the youth and staff is paramount. Such instances require immediate psychiatric intervention. Youth in the RHY programs are transient, and often do not have adequate health supports, proper medications, or pre-existing community supports. Given the age of onset of mental illness, many of the youth in our RHY and foster care programs are also experiencing their first mental health emergency. We are glad that the council recognizes that the current resources for emergency mental health calls are not sufficient. Our team has experienced long response times over two hours, outsized responses, and insufficient assistance when NYPD has arrived on site. A recent call where a young person was locked into the bathroom and was refusing to engage with staff in verbal responses, also thus having extensive history in mental illness, um, summoned 14 police uh, officers on uh, site. It is such response that caused not only re-traumatization to the youth, but also to the other young people in the home. Additionally, we have found that sometimes some police officers arrive and they're looking for a young person to act out as if that is the only indication of mental illness. They are unfamiliar with trauma-informed techniques to coach the youth to accept services and in times have made it extremely difficult to have a young person escorted to the psychiatric ER. We believe here at Sheltering Arms that intro 2010 is long overdue, important and necessary to support and affect the system for emergency mental health response. Sheltering Arms strongly supports this bill makes the following recommendations to strengthen them. The protocols must be developed with meaningful involvement of community-based organizations, mental health providers, and NYPD. We support setting a 30 minute response time and urge the council to ensure that the Office of Community Mental Res mental health receive resources it takes to make this a reality. 30 minutes is an ambitious response time giving that mobile crisis response within two hours. Finally, we support intro 2222. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Sabrina Evans Ellis. You may begin when the Sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Lewis, bill sponsors and other esteemed guests. Thank you for hosting this forum for public testimony in response to the proposed bill to create an Office of Community Mental Health and a citywide mental health emergency response protocol. My name is Sabrina Evans Ellis and I'm executive director of the New York City Office of Ramapo for Children. In late 2020, three organizations, Ramapo Training, the National School Climate Center and the Youth Development Institute of which I was executive director, began a merger to leverage the collective strengths of our historic work and service of children and youth. This partnership combines YDI's unique approach of developing sustaining high quality youth development programming, Ramapo's expertise in coaching and training adults, in the skills and techniques that lead to supportive communities and the National School Climate's leadership in developing systemic capacity for school climate improvement. I testify here on behalf of our collective experience and expertise uh, in creating innovative training and capacity building opportunities for professionals. We support the introduction and the spirit of this legislation. It is particularly timely in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting effect on the mental health of New York City residents, especially young people. American youth have been history makers over the last year, leading the charge for racial justice, serving their communities by checking in on adults and volunteering and adjusting to the seismic shift in the way that they learn, unlike any generation before them. But we know that history makers are also stress bearers. We know that uncertainty breeds anxiety and loss of human life and an accustomed lifestyle can bring a depression that yields not only the presence of sadness, but the absence of joy. 
The creation of this office is both timely and essential. Our mental health system has been overrun with the effects of this pandemic, introducing new pressures and exposing and deepening fissures in an already flawed and in inadequate system. What is critically missing from this legislation is the explicit intention to provide targeted services to young people. Um, communities are dependent upon the minds, hearts, and hands of young people, and youth are dependent upon the viability, vitality, and protection and attention of their community. Very specifically, our recommendations center on the provision of care, particularly provided by schools, not-for-profit, and community-based organizations, and are as follows. We must broaden our understanding of mental health support to not only focus on emergency response, but ongoing support strategies and the presence of mental health protective factors, such as the presence of caring and trusting adults, high expectations, engaging activities, community of supports and opportunities to contribute to the world. As public advocate Williams so eloquently stated, mental health is not a public threat nor a criminal issue. It is a public health issue. And as such, prevention is just as important as emergency response. Number two, fully utilize the availability and reach of community-based organizations by training staff in mental health emergency first aid, but also stress management, trauma and resiliency, and the healing-centered engagement strategies of youth development and engagement, leadership, and positive and supportive school climates. Number three, explore non-clinical approaches to supporting health. Not every mental health challenge requires a clinical intervention. Um, there are growth mindset, mindfulness, restorative practices, and other interventions that promote and safeguard the positive mental health of children and youth and can be practiced by any adult that interacts with them. Which brings me to my final recommendation. We often seek individual youth outcomes as proof of impact, which in many instances puts the onus on children and youth to demonstrate growth, healing, and skills attainment. While this may be the desired in outcome, it often leads to implementation of programs that underemphasize the role of environments and the behaviors and actions of the adults within them. It's as if we are tending to a plant that grows of its own volition and is not affected by the quality of the soil, the air, the water, or the attention it receives. This office must also have at its core promotion of training and technical assistance to help community-based organizations and school better train their staff, design scaffolded programming and interventions, and most importantly, engage young people not as passive recipients of met mental health services, but as active participants in their own mental health stewardship and the cultivation of positive mental health for their communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. We next turn to Beth Haruis. You may be in as soon as the sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. Um, I, you're on mute. So we just have to work with the host to get you unmuted. There we go. Okay, yeah, I think I muted on top of him. Um, hold on, let me recast. I am uh, Beth Haroulis, the Senior Staff Attorney at the New York Civil Liberties Union. New York Civil Liberties Union has long been a coalition partner of both CCIT NYC and Communities United for Police Reform. I have listened to and appreciate the council members and public advocates well-considered remarks about the intent behind intros 2210 and 2222 and your deep commitment to getting it right for your family members, your constituents and for all New Yorkers. It is for those reasons we urge the council to withdraw both 2210 and 2222 in favor of developing a truly comprehensive mental health system. One that is based on prevention, one that includes an appropriate and comprehensive community-based strategy for responding to people experiencing mental health crises, one that actually does not embed and perpetuate the NYPD involvement as responders, and one that uses a racial equity framework to inform its design and performance. You will have my written testimony on the matters before this committee later, so I focus on a few points. 2210 purports to limit the reach of law enforcement, leading to the elimination of NYPD for mental health crisis response. As you have heard as written, 2210 regrettably maintains and embeds the outsized role of NYPD in mental health crisis response due to the astonishingly broad definition of public safety emergency. 2210 contains a selection of piecemeal actions that neither establishes an appropriate crisis response model nor affects the breadth of systemic change necessary to address the 180,000 crisis calls NYPD receives annually. At bottom, 2210 is most pernicious because it diverts public attention from the need for genuinely transformative changes to a larger system of care to address the needs of community members. 
preventative services, crisis response and stabilization services, and longer term supports and services, which when provided appropriately in partnership with the impacted person become preventative services. The city should take this opportunity to immediately establish a civilian crisis system that deploys culturally and gender competent social crisis workers, medics and peers, and that does not continue to build on law enforcement officers whose training is incompatible. I urge, I have one comment with respect to 2222. This is a 911 alternative that needs to be fully integrated into a non NYPD controlled dispatch and response system. 2222 does not do that. We thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. We stand ready to work with the members of this committee, the public advocate and appropriate partners to advance truly meaningful policy changes that will save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. We next turn to Antonine Pierre. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Antonine Pierre. I'm the deputy director of the Brooklyn Movement Center and also a steering committee member of Communities United for Police Reform. Today, I'm delivering testimony on behalf of CPR and our campaign to remove police from mental health response in New York City. I wanna say thank you to committee chairs, Adams and Lewis, committee members and other council members here today. So while we appreciate that the intent of intro 2210 is to remove the NYPD from mental health responses and to honor the lives of people killed by the NYPD, nothing in the policy language of the bill achieves these goals. When we talk about uh, removing the NYPD from mental health responses, the bill actually serves, the, the policy language actually increases the role of the NYPD where the NYPD currently does not have a defined legal role in mental health responses. Also, when we talk about this bill's capacity to save the lives of future folks who might be killed by the NYPD, if we're talking about passing this bill in um, to support the families of folks like Saheed Vassal and Kowalski Trawick, their lives would not have been saved by this bill. In particular, Saheed Vassal's family worked for a long time to try to find comprehensive, preventative, and follow-up services for mental health that were not available in Crown Heights. So this bill needs to ensure that systems work just as well on the Upper West Side as in Crown Heights. We know that Black and other communities of color have a history of racist disinvestment from public health and mental health infrastructure. And for this bill to put forth some ideas around crisis response but not address infrastructure really means that it won't be able to prevent future deaths. Finally, I say that this bill, even though it establishes a, a, an Office of Community Mental Health, to, was clearly created without consultation with community. And for these reasons, we oppose intro 2210. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm gonna pause for a moment to see if any council members have any questions or comments. Okay, seeing none, we can turn to the next panel, which will be Peter Horan, Eric Vassal, Michael Matos, and Steve Mizuki. We'll begin with Peter as soon as the sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, committee members. Um, my name is Peter Horan. I'm a longtime resident of New York City. I'm currently residing in uh, District 40 of Flatbush, Brooklyn. Um, right now, uh, there's people, as we've seen in stories that people, that, uh, and other testimonies, there's people afraid to call 911 for mental health crises because they know that an armed, untrained police officer might show up and seriously harm or kill someone they love. Uh, nobody takes the job of a, being a police officer so they can help people with mental issues. Those people become social workers and mental health professionals, and these are the people who should be handling these issues. Um, everywhere we see more NYPD, we see problems. More police on the subway means not just more threats of violence and harassment to unhoused New Yorkers, but actually a spike in crime is reported today by CBS New York. More police in schools means student conduct issues solved with handcuffs. More police handling DOT responsibilities means squad cars on sidewalks and placard abuse. There's simply better people and better offices to handle all these issues. Uh, more specifically to this hearing, I don't believe the NYPD's involvement in mental health crises is appropriate at all. Um, as uh, the saying goes, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, the pandemic has only increased public awareness of mental health and its complications, experiences, and treatments. Why the NYPD suspended training for mental health because of COVID is beyond me. If first grade can continue in the city, I don't know, understand why mental health training can't continue for the NYPD, especially when New Yorkers need it the most. 
Um, and I just want to say that uh, we should just let trained professionals do their job, do the training, and be allowed to respond appropriately to mental health crises in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Eric Vassell. You can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. You're still muted. Yeah, good evening. Um, good afternoon, Council. My name is Eric Vassell, father of Said Vassell, who was killed by the Strategic Response Group officers on April 4, 2018. I am here today to oppose Bill 2210. The topic of this bill is close to my heart because my son Said struggled with mental health issue. I want to make it clear that this bill would not have saved Said lives. First, you cannot build a mental health response system without also creating and funding better mental health care for the black and brown community. The mental issue we are facing in the black and brown community is another pandemic because of racism. We need a different model, not the psychiatric model that intro 2210 relies on. My son Saeed first struggled with mental health issue after a close friend of his was killed by the police. Saeed needed help, help to progress the tumor, but he was given a whole lot of tablets. For Saeed being in hospital, it's like he's been in prison. We could not find any program that would help him. Intro 2210 only connects people with system that de dehumanize and criminalize them. The city has not made it priority to develop the service we really need in the black and brown community. Second, intro 22 make it so that the NYPD will still arrive many of our many of the situation when people just need help. This will not work if you are a black and brown when the NYPD see the color of your skin, ego kicks in, maybe they will step back if the person is white. But even if this bill is passed, they will still treat black and brown people as criminals. It is not enough to retrain 911 operator when one main problem is that the NYPD control 911. Racism means that black and brown children are always seen as dangerous. We need the 911 system to be taken out of the hand of the police. I appreciate you trying to address this problem, but please do it right. Intro 2210 should not move forward or else there will be more Saeed Vassal, more Mohammed Ba, and more Kawaski Travi. Thank you very much for listening to my testimony. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Michael Matos. Michael, you can begin when the ser sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Matos, born and raised New Yorker and a concerned citizen. I'd like to first thank the council for the opportunity to speak on this incredibly important issue. For a long time, the topic of mental health crisis has often been a neglected subject of conversation, but gladdens me to see legislation being drafted to address it. In my experience as a first responder with the U.S. Coast Guard, I've learned the extreme importance of utilizing the right resources when handling life-threatening situations. In matters of mental health emergency response, our current system is ineffective and proven dangerous. Officers of the NYPD lack the training, qualifications, and judgment to recognize and address mental health crises as they occur. As many before me have mentioned, the countless instances of fatal encounters between those enduring such crises and the NYPD prove that change must be made. No one reaching out for help will, while enduring a mental health emergency wants to be deemed a, quote, threat to officer safety, unquote, upon first contact. I'd like to thank Chair Lewis and all additional sponsors of 2210 for pushing this bill forward. However, we must relieve the NYPD of this responsibility and ensure their response is refocused to address matters for which they are trained and funded for, violent crime. I'd also like to express my support for 2222 and applaud Public Advocate Williams for sponsoring this groundbreaking bill. Excuse me, this groundbreaking bill. The establishment of a three-digit hotline dedicated to mental health emergency response is an excellent example of our commitment as a community to effectively handle this ongoing issue. This hits home for myself and the love I have from a military veteran community where mental health emergencies are unfortunately all too common. 
over the past year, there have been many, excuse me, there have been numerous situations where I wish I had such a hotline exist that I could utilize to assist my friends who've experienced such emergencies without them fearing of being mistaken for an active threat. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Steve Matsuki. You can begin when the sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. Um, I live in Chelsea, um, and I, uh, I thank you all for your time and for listening. Um, I appreciate what others have said before me, and I just want to echo uh, their support for itch Intro 2210, um, especially the Mental Health Emergency Response Unit, um, and stress that we do need an alternative to police responses um, to these situations. We've seen the tragic effects of armed responses to mental health crisis um, for years. Um, people like Daniel Prude and Walter Wallace Jr., uh, their stories are as heartbreaking as the numbers are painful. Um, the biggest one for me is 1,400, which is the number of people in a mental health crisis who have lost their lives to police since 2015, uh, according to the Washington Post. Clearly the wrong people are being sent to many of these distress calls and to thousands more that result in violent and unnecessary arrests. And studies have shown that even when, when cops have extra crisis training, the violence doesn't significantly drop. De-escalation is key in these situations. And uh, I can tell you that as a bike press protester who has been needlessly arrested myself, I can tell you that is not the strong suit of armed and armored cops. The right people are medics and crisis workers like those in Eugene, Oregon's alternative program, CAHOOTS, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, they take upwards of 20,000 distress calls per year and their unarmed response teams resolve more than 99% of them without uh, calling for police backup. Uh, a much bigger city, Denver, is taking a page from their book and launched a pilot program called STAR last summer, which handles hundreds of trespassing alerts, welfare checks, and similar issues with no need for police backup or arrests at all. These approaches dramatically boost the odds of people with mental health issues getting the help they need and drop the odds of them getting needlessly arrested, injured, or killed. Time expired. Right now, New York City has a unique opportunity to be a leader and show the rest of the country that mental health crises can be handled with compassion, not cuffs. Uh, and this is that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much to this panel. I'll now pause for a moment to see if we have any council member questions. Okay, seeing none, we're gonna turn to the next panel. Janine Rock, Christine Henson, Camila Spielman, and Ricardo Miranda. Janine Rock, you can go as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Your time starts now. Good morning, my name is Janine Rock and I thank you for this opportunity. In order to keep people safe and address the needs of the public, I wanted to express my support for the establishment of an Office of Community Mental Health, but ultimately to remove any police involvement. Mental illness should not be a death sentence. Unfortunately, this has been the fate of those who have lost their lives at the hands of police responding to mental crises. It's so important that people with the proper training and experience are responding to these issues and not armed officers. NYPD and law enforcement nationally have displayed poor de-escalation skills. A gun shouldn't be so easy to reach for and a life should not be so easy to take. During a mental health check, a police officer shot and killed 52-year-old Texan Patrick Warren in January after someone yelled for the officer not to shoot. His family had called for help the previous day and a mental health professional responded and could relate to and calm Warren who agreed to go to the hospital. The unpreparedness of the officer who would respond to the family's call the following day would result in the loss of a man's life. In our own state of New York, March of last year, several officers responding to one man's emergency resulted in the loss of Daniel Prude. In Pennsylvania, 19-year-old Christian Hall had his hands up when he was shot and killed by police. As we've heard today, there are many more in the city I may not have even heard about yet, but use of excessive force by police is nothing new. The day after Walter Wallace's shooting, our then president proclaimed his stance with law enforcement and said, just let them do their job. Police, however, have demonstrated how ill-equipped they are. This isn't a job for them. It's necessary not only to save lives, but also to provide resources for individuals and their families and putting specific procedures into lasting law. 
This office should, cooperate, should coordinate the needs of agencies and organizations citywide and listen to their expertise. And I know I would feel much more confident having a number to call as I find calling the police to be inviting a genuine threat into my neighborhood. With the need for support for mental health, that can mean anyone and everyone. I'm not just speaking up for those who are experiencing a crisis today, but for all of us. The way we can respond to those in need reflects on our own humanity. Thank you again for listening to me today. And I wanna thank the council, those who worked on writing this bill, I want to thank those working to serve mental health needs in specific communities, and I want to thank the tireless work of the activists, organizers, and protesters who are hitting the streets time and time again. I've learned so much from these folks, and their work is the reason we can speak up and have our voice heard. But the voice of the people is also always on the streets as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Christine Henson. Your time starts now. Hello, my name is Christine Henson, and my son's name is Andrew Henson. He is affected by autism and limited speech. When Andrew was 16, he was assaulted by NYPD officers. Um, Andrew, his first encounter, um, he is lucky, as we are, his family to be lucky that he's a survivor. I'm here to oppose intro 2210 and make sure you understand that it's not going to work to have NYPD show up along with mental health response teams. My son's experience um, is not, you know, something that we will be able to ever disregard. Um, NYPD is not fit to provide the care for loved ones affected by special needs and mental distress. Shamefully, the bill will continue to put families like mine in dangerous situations where we could lose our loved ones with disabilities. My son needed an evaluation. Um, instead, he was brutalized by police officers. On October 9th of 2018, I had set up a meeting with his principal because he needed an updated speech evaluation. Uh, the principal recommended Bronx Care. She had a staff member place a call for ambulance to transport us there. And the... Um, the evaluation was supposed to take place that day. The principal instructed a staff member to call for an ambulance. However, police officers were present on the scene before the ambulance. Uh, police officers disregarded me. No one said anything to me. When we stepped out of the ambulance, we noticed that there were over two dozen NYPD officers present. Um, I asked why the police were there. No one answered me. I was ignored. After we stepped out of the ambulance to enter into the location, um, he told me he wanted something to eat. He took a step, the EMT placed his hand on my side to prevent him from walking. And that must have been a lead for officers to then jump on my son. His arms were grabbed behind his back by five officers while a security officer placed his hands around my son's neck and twisted his neck. Again, my son is affected by limited speech and he is a child. Um, again, I was ignored. I was totally um, disregarded. I screamed for them to stop. No one listened. Uh, they surrounded my son. They piled on top of him. I watched my son's body go limp after that. That was provided. That, you know, that chokehold. Um, I heard Andrew screaming and excruciating pain when the security guard twisted his neck. Um, they forced my son on his knees and his face onto a bench. My son needed medical attention and care that was gentle, not criminalization, abuse, trauma, or near death experience. My son's experience is exactly what will continue to happen if intro 2210 is passed. This bill ensures that NYPD will show up along with mental health response teams in many, if not most cases, just as they showed up along with my EMTs and my son's experience. The bill should not be allowed to be passed. It does not honor the families who have lost loved ones to police who were in emotional distress and it does not honor families like mine. We also must remove 911 from the control of NYPD or else black and brown communities will continue being criminalized. Restraining is not enough. If 911 stays with NYPD, the default will also be to send police. I ask that you put yourself in my shoes, in my family's shoes, especially Andrew's shoes who his voice is limited. Um, and if you're a person of color, do you want to live in fear? What is it like if you are voice to live in fear? Or you can be brutalized or even worse, killed. Uh, mental health emergencies can happen to anyone. Our loved ones, 
with special needs do not need to be brutalized. Do you truly think it is safe to have NYPD to be sent to emotional distress calls? We need to break this pattern and stop criminalizing black and brown people who are struggling with mental health and disabilities that need a certain appropriate and safe and secure type of attention, not to be able to endure pain and suffering that has longevity and frightens them. Thank you. So I thank you for this opportunity. Please, it, it needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Our next panelist is Camila Spielman. You can begin as your soon time. as the president cues you. Your time starts now. Good morning, Chair Lewis and members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction. My name is Camilla Spielman. I thank the committee for the opportunity to testify. Also, I thank you, Christine Henderson, um, for speaking up. I appreciate um, your courage. And however, I will say that I am speaking in support of intro 2210 because I believe that it is um, our pathway to get the NYPD out from the umbrella of the responsibility. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, yes, yeah, so I know many New Yorkers will agree when I say this that I do not trust the NYPD. I know myself and many other New Yorkers have taken up the practice of policing the police. When I see an officer arresting someone or engaging with anyone, I stand by and I begin recording because I have seen how situations that should have been responded with standard protocol have ended up in physical abuse or death and far more often for black and brown people. NYPD officers and most police departments around the country carry too much power and bear too much responsibility with too little training. NYPD officers are not equipped to resolve situations where individuals um, are experiencing mental health emergencies. While the NYPD do receive a short training on this, we know that frequently they are not prepared. And that in fact, NYPD quite often tends to ex escalate situations with people um, who are having mental or behavioral health crises. I think we, we can all agree that police officers are not to train the, the needs of such a person. And they are not practiced enough in the empathy and care that is needed to safely and successfully guide someone in a crisis. I believe that passing this bill along with creating a three digit mental health crisis call number would create the resources our community lacks for safely responding to mental health crises, remove police officers from their role as first responders and would equip community members, friends, neighbors, and bystanders who out of distrust want to avoid calling the NYPD at all times with effective means to keep each other safe. Finding the gaps within mental health provision, coordinating between city agencies, community organizations, and mental health providers to create a baseline protocol will create the infrastructure to maintain the system and move out from under the umbrella of police responsibility. And in the ramping up time while this process is being established, or in the case that a mental health emergency response protocol can't provide services for every emergency call, the NYPD must have protocols in place to realistically de-escalate situations and hopefully have training that lasts more than four days, as currently is the case, and must honestly and accurately report what happens on these calls. At protests, we ask, who keep us safe? And we answer, we keep us safe, because we know with the system how it is, we have to look out for each other. How about our city? Our police department keeps us safe. Pass these bills. Establish an Office of Community Health. Establish a mental health emergency response unit. Send mental health professionals to care for our people and effectively train police to de-escalate and be accountable for protecting the people they claim to protect. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Ricardo Miranda. You can begin as soon as the Sergeant cues you. Starting time. Hello, my name is Ricardo Miranda. I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force, a former educator working with children with physical and mental disabilities, and almost five year resident of the city. And I also suffer from PTSD related anxiety attacks. Um, this past fall, I was in a group of people protesting outside of one police plaza. At this time, I was tackled by more officers than I can recall. The one thing that really sticks with me outside of the fact that one sergeant very gleefully attempted to punch me in the face more than once is the entire group of police officers yelling stop resisting over and over and over again as they dogpiled on top of my body. The fact that they cannot understand a basic human condition of fight or flight in a situation like this 
gives me no confidence that if they were to encounter one of my former students or one of my fellow veterans suffering from some sort of mental uh, break, that they would have any sort of ability to control their self and not put the, these people in more danger. Um, if you approach a situation armed and ready to use that armament, the situation will only end in conflict utilizing that armament. There's no reason for anyone with a, with a weapon to show up to a situation where someone is having a mental health crisis. Um, I spent the entire last week trying to come up with some sort of analogy for what sending an armed police officer into a situation requiring empathy would be. But the best one I can come up with is that it is much like sending an armed police officer into a situation where empathy is required. This is not a situation that they are trained for. This is not a situation where they even want to be. That is evident by the fact that when we see these situations, they are always angry. They start out angry and they end in injury and death more often than they should. Um, I, I had some more personal stories, but I, I don't think that I have the time to, to convey them. Um, so thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And again, as a reminder to all panelists, if you want to submit written testimony, there's no length limit and we read all of it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Council Member Ayala, who has some questions for this panel. Yeah, I don't have a question per se, but I just wanted to, you know, um, one thank uh, Ms. Hansen for coming in to testify. And um, just to clarify that I think that the intent of the bill, and I think this is a great conversation, it's a great start, but the intent of the bill is to remove the NYPD. Um, I don't know how many of you caught my uh, opening remarks, but you know, this is something that, you know, and I consider myself part of the impacted community as well. My family has been, you know, dealing with uh, mental illness. Some members of my family mem uh, have been dealing with mental illness for most of their lives. And, you know, um, and I mentioned the, you know, the, the fear of having to uh, make that 911 call because quite frankly, when I was making the 911 call, I wasn't intending to call the NYPD. I was merely looking to contact someone with emergency uh, exper health experience, right? I was hoping that the EMT would respond first. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't happen. And we don't control those systems right now, right? We don't control who responds and when and how they react once they get there. And I think that the intent of the bill is to really to clarify um, those roles to remove the police uh, department um, from responding in the first place. But in those instances where we cannot control and we won't be able to control all situations, if the police by you know coincidence or because someone else made a, a different type of call does happen to show up that they are also trained and how to respond. Uh, appropriately. So I, I really just want to say thank you that I, I want to recognize, you know, that, you know, I am hearing uh, all of the uh, the feedback. Thank you for all of the wonderful suggestions. I understand with the, you know, um, ambiguities coming from um, that is not our intent. And we, you know, have no intentions of passing a bill until we get it right, because we want to make sure that this bill is actually helping the impacted community and not hurting. So thank you all for coming to testify today. Thank you very much, Council Member Ayala. Uh, our next and final panel will be Sarah Sitzler and Christina Sparrick. Uh, and we'd like to tell folks that if we inadvertently missed anyone, please use the Zoom raise hand function at the bottom of the screen and we'll make sure that you could testify after. Um, so we'll begin with Sarah Sitzler. As soon as the sergeant cues you, you may begin. Starting time. Hi, um, thank you, Chair Lewis, and thank you, Council Member Ayala, um, for making that clarification. Um, because I am, well, my name is Sarah Sitzler. I'm a resident of District 40, and I really, I want is, wanted to focus on changing the language, as so many people have mentioned, changing the language of the bill to really explicitly exclude NYPD involvement. Um, and thank you to everyone who spoke and all the people who are working day, like every single day with these directly with people um, who are suffering from uh, mental illnesses. And uh, I just wanna say police should not be called for mental, mental health emergencies ever um, because deploying the police implies a criminal element is present. Um, and it's detrimental to that person in crisis getting that help that they need. 
a person in a mental health crisis requires help from individuals who possess the delicate skilled de-escalation training and experience. And the police, no matter what training that they receive, they just don't possess the same skills to really be proactive in these cases of crises because they are not healthcare providers. Um, and we just can't allow any more senseless deaths at the hands of the police. According to the Treatment Advocacy Center, people with untreated mental illnesses are 16 times more likely to be killed during a police encounter than other civilians approached by law enforcement. And as we've seen time and time again, police response to individuals in mental health crisis, especially black men has tragically resulted in their deaths. And these men deserve not only humanity, when they, which they are denied at the hands of the police, but they deserved real compassion and care. And I want to stress the importance of the preventative care here because they deserve care not only in the moments that they were in a crisis, but they deserve care in the days, weeks, months leading up to this crisis. And, and it's not only the senseless deaths that are destroying families, but there's so much trauma experienced by I'm inspired. people during their most vulnerable moments, in times of crisis, when they are dehumanized and brutalized by police, these are experiences that leave emotional scars that are often lifelong afflictions compounded on top of their mental illnesses. Um, it's just an immeasurable disservice to the public and to the NYPD to keep officers involved in mental health emergency responses. And it's time that we start treating mental health as a medical issue that it is and not a criminal issue that it is not. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Christina Sparrick, followed by Jeff Strabone. So Christina, you can begin as soon as the sergeant cues you. Greeting, my name is Christina. Greeting, my name is Christina Sparrick. I'm a steering committee member of Correct Crisis Intervention Today, or CCIT NYC, an organization with over 80 members advocating for non-police responses to mental health calls. I'm a mental health advocate, a peer specialist, and a certified public accountant and I've had direct experience with police when having a mental health crisis of my own. CCIT has, has six major concerns with 2210. First, the role of the police. Our concern is the, the inclusion of police as responders as opposed to a peer-led mental health crisis response team. Police respond to criminals and people having mental health crisis are not criminals, but in fact, like the previous presenter, 16 more, like 16, 16 more times likely to be killed by police compared to those without a mental illness. And in the past five years, despite the CIT training, 16 individuals experiencing mental health crisis were killed by police of whom 14 were black or people of color. As the public safety emergency definition by including terms like crimes, violence, and harms to the public is too broad and allows police to be involved in potentially all mental health crises, not acceptable. Our second concern is the role of the Department of Mental Health, the Department of Mental Hygiene and Health. DOHMH should not be the entity to provide crisis response services, but contract with a peer-driven community-based organization. Additionally, Mental health count, a mental health council consisting of at least 51% peers who are trauma informed and culturally sensitive should be working alongside DOHMH, DOHMH to make decisions. Third, the racial equity framework. The proposed crisis response program does not use racial equity framework to inform its design and performance. The program is to exist in isolation, divorced from comprehensive public health system that is based on crisis prevention and does not address health and recovery outcomes. Fourth, the emergency response team. The mental health emergency response team is 30 minutes, 30 minutes, which it poses a great health risk as well as an increased chance of police involvement. It is outright discrimination for emergencies experienced by individuals with mental, mental health disabilities to have longer response times than other emergencies. Notably, EMS average response time for life-threatening medical emergencies is 8.32 minutes and non-life-threatening medical emergencies is only 10.4 minutes. All lives matter, mental health lives matter. Fifth, the emergency medical technicians, we are concerned with some undefined mental health clinicians responding to mental health crisis. 
Mental health clinicians who are often detached to the individuals practice a clinical model where individuals are diagnosed, medicated, and possibly stabilized. In addition to CCIT NYC, we strongly recommend that mental health crisis response teams consist of emergency medical technicians. Often physical health problems are masked by mental health crises. So the service of EMT can be crucial in a crisis response. And last but not least, the lack of consultation with peers and advocates. Hoping going for nothing about us um, is our peer, peer and mental health community po policy. And we hope that we can sit at the table going forward to help make better decisions. However, there are aspects of the, in the, of the bill of 2210 that CCIT does with support. Uh, one, the role of peers. Two, the alternative hotline number like 988, monthly and annual reporting, the follow-up by mental health emergency response units with an individual who, who sought help from the unit, the goal of reducing mental health emergencies through preventive care, and lastly, limiting police dispatch when summoned by mental health emergency units and ensuring that once dispatched, the police follow the unit's instructions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next panelist will be Jeff Strabone. Jeff, you can begin as soon as you are queued. Starting time. Good, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Lewis and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Strabone. I'm a lifelong resident New Yorker and former vice chair of community board six in Brooklyn. I live in the 39th district. I thank the committee for its time and for listening. The subject of my testimony today is intro 2210. To put it simply, People with mental health emergencies don't need police with guns. They need a different kind of help. And around the country, many police forces know this too. My written statement will include testimony from October by the Connecticut chapter of the National Association of Social Workers, listing cities around the country that have created or piloted similar 911 alternatives using social workers. Denton, Texas, Dallas, Alexandria, Kentucky, Greensboro, North Carolina, Eugene, Oregon, Olympia, Washington, Denver, Albuquerque, Los Angeles, Buffalo, Willimantic, Connecticut, and New Haven. I hope New York City will add itself to this list of innovative cities. New York should not be outdone by Willimantic, Connecticut. Police are not social workers or psychologists, and we should not task them with roles and responsibilities far beyond their expertise. Police know this. After a mass shooting of police officers in Dallas in July, 2016, Dallas Police Chief David Brown said the following, quote, we're asking cops to do too much in this country. We are. Every societal failure, we put it off on the cops to solve. Not enough mental health funding, let the cops handle it. Not enough drug addiction funding, let's give it to the cops. That's too much to ask. Policing was never meant to solve all those problems, unquote. Chief Brown was right, and New York should listen. Since the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, our federal, state, and local governments have cut and cut and cut all but two types of funding, war and police. If you cut mental health spending and increase police spending year after year, you're going to be sending police to mental health crises that they're not equipped to deal with. You know the I'm saying, uh, 15 seconds if I may. You all know the saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. I say don't send a cop with a gun to someone's dark night of the soul. Send a social worker. Let cops be cops and social workers be social workers. They're not the same. We need both, fund both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will now pause a moment to allow any panelists that we inadvertently miss to use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay. Um, we will also be pausing for a moment to see if anyone else will be logging on to testify. And in the meantime, I turn to Chair Lewis and any other council members that might have additional questions or any closing remarks. No questions here. I'll just provide closing remarks at that time. Council member Ayala, do you have any? Chair Lewis, we're gonna Chair Lewis was just going to give a couple of minutes um, to see if some other folks sign on. 
Journalists. We have a New York State Assembly member Anderson. Sara, can you have the Assembly member uh, sure. testify? Thank you. Uh, and we'd like to cue New York State Assembly member Khalil Anderson. As soon as the sergeant cues you and the host unmutes you, you can begin your testimony whenever you're ready. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Council. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman, for having this critically, critically important hearing and discussion around uh, what mental health looks like in the NYPD. Uh, you know, I'm here to voice my support for removing police and law enforcement from mental health crises and emergencies. Uh, for far too long, we have seen uh, casualties, uh, or, or excuse me, we've, we have casually accepted uh, for that matter, police and law enforcement to be the Swiss army knife, to be the, the folks that are, are the, the main responders, if you will, for every crisis and every emergency, whether it's a dog being lost, uh, to a cat stuck in a tree, to more serious cases um, um, that should be uh, flowed outside of the NYPD. Um, academic research, uh, nationally, national and local news reports, um, and all the traumatic lived experiences uh, conclude that we as a society need to reimagine, reimagine the basic fundamental role of policing. And that's uh, what I believe that this discussion around mental health and the NYPD's role in that space is about today. We're just very familiar with all the research, whether it's school to prison pipeline, um, et cetera, those different types of pipelines. There is a pipeline of mental illness to incarceration. Uh, and if we don't stem that pipeline now in this moment and in this discussion, we're going to be uh, faced with uh, over-policing as we are faced with now, but an increased over-policing in that respect, particularly uh, I wanna comment on this piece too, particularly because we don't have institutions and spaces uh, for folk who are suffering with uh, mental illness to be able to rehabilitate the, the space of incarceration, our prisons uh, and criminal justice system uh, becomes the space uh, in which they occupy. We don't have supportive housing. We're losing mental health beds. Even this executive budget that was recently proposed by Governor Cuomo um, that we're currently as the legislature reviewing has some problematic things as it relates to investing uh, in mental health. And I say problematic at the bare minimum uh, of, of, of the, the feelings that I have uh, about this budget. We can't live in a city where we imagine, uh, where our imagination in general is just so bankrupt uh, that we can't envision alternatives to abusive, predatory, unethical, illegal re recklessness and violent policing while also not addressing some of the systemic underlying issues uh, as it relates to their relationship with folks who are mentally ill. We also must dare to imagine, uh, imagine families calling uh, for help for a loved one who's in emotional distress, but scared or, uh, whether or not to, to call the police or to call uh, a, a service provider. And when they call the police, uh, it could result in the death uh, of that loved one or family member. We shouldn't be uh, afraid uh, in that moment to call out for help. And that's what many New Yorkers are afraid of. Um, and lastly, I think we need to imagine a city where mental health is destigmatized de uh, de and also decriminalized. Uh, we should not be criminalized uh, for being uh, folks or, or folks who struggle with mental health issues. And <clears throat> that's kind of where I stand on that issue. And, and having a, a district and representing a district uh, where we've had negative uh, interactions with police as it relates to mental health. I'm speaking um, from experience. I'm speaking for what I've seen and watched. Uh, and I, I would also dare to say that some of our colleagues uh, who are in 
uh, policing would agree that a lot of, uh, uh, of, of issues rest on their shoulders that really should not. And I strongly believe um, that this is one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assembly Member. We're just gonna give one more minute in case any additional panelists sign on. Okay, and I see that we've been joined by Carl Valeri, who will be testifying next, as soon as the host unmutes them and uh, the sergeant cues them, they can begin testifying. Starting time. Thank you so much. Um, thank you uh, to Chair Lewis, uh, as well as the Mental Health Committee. Uh, my name is Carl A. Valer. I am the Chief of Staff to New York State Assembly Member Khalil M. Anderson here in District 31 of Queens. I'm also a former um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, mental health instructor and trainer, uh, where for nearly four years I taught mental health courses across New York City. Um, I would teach diverse audiences that included our faith communities, um, different uh, healthcare professionals, as well as law enforcement. Um, and the narrative um, and the fact remains the same uh, that we want to make sure that police, as the assembly member said, aren't the Swiss army knife to respond to any and every crisis or emergency. In fact, during the many courses that I taught, police officers and law enforcement would say that they didn't want to be the only response. Um, they weren't trained, they weren't adequately equipped to be able to respond to mental health crises, okay? Uh, as a lifelong New Yorker, for the entirety of, of, of my time here in New York City, we've seen, unfortunately, uh, far too many tragedies. Um, when I was a community organizer in Flatbush, Brooklyn, uh, there was the tragic story of Duane June, uh, whose mom called um, in, in search of help, in search of assistance um, for her son who was experiencing a mental health crisis and emotional distress uh, when tragically uh, he was killed at Flatbush Gardens. Uh, just a few years ago in Crown Heights, Saeed Vassal uh, was also uh, killed um, when he was experiencing a mental health crisis. And so as the assembly member just said, um, we know that there are school to prison pipelines, um, we know there's school to confinement pipelines, but there's also mental illness to incarceration, mental illness to homelessness, um, and mental illness to death pipelines. So we want to make sure uh, that we get folks the services and the support they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll pause to see if we've inadvertently missed any members or any panelists. Okay, seeing none, I will now turn back to Chair Lewis to give closing remarks and to close out the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Anderson, for joining us today and for your remarks. I also want to thank Councilmember Ayala for, for her leadership and for her adv advocacy and for wanting to push hard for equitable and appropriate mental health services and support to those that need it here in New York City. Thank you for all you do. I wanna thank all the advocates, families that testified today and for lending your voice to this conversation. These discussions help us to learn about the policy changes that need to be made and the appropriate needs that need to be provided and expedited. And it's up to us to take those steps to ensure we get this right. So <clears throat> I wanna thank you all for being here today. Um, and as chair, I just wanna also share that I look forward to supporting my colleagues and advocates on ways we could reform responses to me mental health crises, as well as reducing the stigma and discrimination around mental health and creating more supportive measures. Thank you again to the committee staff for your support um, on my first day of being uh, chair for this committee. And I am calling this meeting to a close. Thank you.